Welcome to Darknet Demystified. My name is Sam Bem. I'm a former Darknet vendor and market admin. Now I'm a content creator, author, hacker, and paralegal. On this show, I dive into topics related to the Darknet. If you're interested in evaluating your security by looking at a case in which an individual went against the federal governments of the world, then you're in the right place. By looking at darknet vendors and how they ran their business, along with their mistakes, we can see how they operate inside of highly hostile environments with adversaries who have black or unlimited budgets to catch them. In this episode, we're going to veer off a little bit, and instead of looking at a different darknet vendor, we're going to be looking at my case. In August of, or maybe it was a little bit after that, of 2022, I had done an interview and it just recently was published. And now because it was published, I'm putting out this full interview, which is the actual almost three hour interview, not the one that was shown, which was just an hour. So The one thing I don't do in this, which is pretty typical of me on this podcast, is to point out or, you know, say that this video, this vendor did, you know, this stupid thing. Um, And my stupid thing was trusting my cousin and not maintaining good supervision over her. So to be fair, you know, that was idiotic. (laughs) I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was being uh, as fair as I could be in evaluation of of vendors on this podcast. So there you have it. Now, without any further ado, I'll present you with the full recording of the actual podcast. And I want a um, confirmation that it's, is it okay to record this call to put it on the podcast, Darknet Diary? It is okay to record this call and put it on the podcast, Darknet Diaries. Cool. Thanks, my lord. Appreciate that. (laughs) So, um, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming your, uh, criminal spree is over, but I do not want to know about any future things you may be cooking up, uh, that may be illegal because it puts me in an awkward spot. Yeah, definitely um, not. Definitely not. uh, Uh, just, just us, like, even, even if I had, I, I mentioned something to you, uh, federally, you are literally part of a conspiracy now and yeah. you can get uh, up to 10 years. So I, I take it very seriously. Um, even like when I was incarcerated, I would have guys who would walk up to me and they'd be like, oh, when I get out, I'm going to sell Coke right this time. I'd be like, listen, man, get the fuck away from me. You know, like, what, what is wrong with you, dumbass? Like, you're guaranteed <laughs> to come back. You know, like, you know, like, and, and like, because you have guys there who will absolutely take that and, you know, bring it to a United States attorney and they'll snitch on you while they're in prison to try to get a rule 35 B and get out early, you know? Um, oh. so it's just, it's like, I don't want to hear anything about any of that. So I absolutely understand that. That's great that you have that, um, that mindset of, you know, don't, don't try to involve me, um, uh, in anything yeah. because, you know, federal, you know, the feds, man, they have a 99% conviction rate. So, you know, if you get indicted, you're screwed. Like you're you're going to prison. You know, right? Unless you tell on a bunch of people. Yes, and, um, if, and if you didn't actually do anything, you have no one to tell on. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm glad we're on the same page there. So, um, yeah. Basically, what I'll do is I'll try to um, ask you questions, walk you through your story, and then, um, yeah, and then I'll put it together. So it's going to take me a couple months to put it together before you can listen, and then you'll you'll hear it before it gets published. That's cool. Yeah. So uh, one thing I will tell you, uh, you can feel free at any point um, to tell me, hey, man, like get back on track. Because one thing you will notice is that um, I do deviate uh, a lot of the times. And that's like because I'm an INTP. So like when I'm explaining something, you know, sometimes there's 20 other things that created that situation that I feel need to be addressed in order to have full comprehension of a given situation. And sometimes, you know, I get lost on that path. <laughs> so yeah, feel free definitely to be understand. like, dude, like you're way off topic. You know, like we're, you know, you're talking about 
spaceships and, and bass. <laughs> <you know? laughs> All right. I can do that. Okay. So um, let's start out with your name. So my oh, name's... so what do you want to be known for, known as on here as well? Because you may you may want a moniker or something. Oh no! So um, my name's Sam Ben. Uh, it's a matter of public record. Uh, also, I'm also known as doing Fed time uh, online and uh, Killa B. Um, that was my hacker alias for a while, and um, also one two one eight nine zero eight two, which you know it's almost like you know talking to Jean Valjean, but um, it's. <laughs> It, that, yeah. So that was my Fed number. So yeah, that's, that's I got a couple of aliases. Oh, so it's it's kill a B like the Wu Tang Clan, not kill a Ab. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. <laughs> got it. Um. All right. So we got a darknet story here. Um. How did you get exposed to darknet? What was your first kind of experience there? So I had known. I remember when Silk Road came out. Uh, initially and i remember when bitcoin came out i remember having uh they had uh btc faucet around for a while and like bt btc faucet was basically a website where like you could go and if you went there every day you would get you know anywhere from like initially maybe 50 bitcoin to five bitcoin or then you know fractions as it went on but you would get that for free um so like i'd had this this exposure to cryptocurrencies and to the dark net in general for a long time, uh, because I had been in information technology um, and cybersecurity. I did a lot of residential work mainly, but I was always that that was always kind of my thing. I loved I loved computers. Um, I loved how they work. Like you know, if you read, you know, you hop on Frack um, and you read the Hacker's Manifesto, you know. Whenever I have someone who's like, hey, man, how do I hack? You know, the super generic question. It's like, you know, asking an artist how they're an artist, right? It's <laughs> just so many possibilities. Like, what medium are you talking about? You know, I think for hackers, it's like, you know, we have like the social engineering. We have, you know, guys who are lock pickers. We got guys who, you know, they're they're coding, you know, a buffer overflow and ASM, like, like just incredibly brilliant. But like, you know, we have different artists who do kind of the same thing in different ways. So like that age old question of like, how do I hack is like one that really can't be answered directly because it depends on who you are. But going back to your question, how I learned about it was by osmosis because I had already been in the information technology realm, that field. So when those things came out and they became like, you know, common knowledge among those people, the limited amount of people who knew about those things existing, um, like I learned about them, like it didn't have to, it didn't have to be on CNN or Fox news or MSNBC for, for me to pick it up and, and, uh, see it. But when I remember when Silk Road, it came out, like, I honestly, I thought it was a scam. You know, I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was a bunch of feds that ran it. And like, uh -huh. it was just a big, you know, it was just a, like a, a big sting operation. Um, and then as time went on and I learned a little bit more about it, you know, I realized it wasn't, I didn't care. Um, about it at the time because I had no need for like I had no ambition to be a darknet vendor. It wasn't like oh man, like I I want to do this, you know, in a year or like it, you know, me becoming a darknet vendor was more something that happened as a evolutionary necessity, which is not true, but in my mind, I made true. Um, through like, you know, self-rationalization, um, which I like to think, you know, each of us has an infinite ocean of self-rationalization um, to justify whatever we we end up doing. Um, and for me, my self-rationalization for becoming a dark net vendor um, was to, you know, get out of a, a situation that I was in with um, a woman that I was with who was just a nightmare. I'd been with her for 10 years and uh, we had gotten into an argument and she basically told me, she was like, um, yeah, I cheated on you seven years ago. And like, cause we were, we were arguing about peas. Uh, my daughter got like, uh, you know, cause I had, I had two stepdaughters and a son and I had made them dinner. And when I had given them dinner, uh, my ex was like, oh, you gave her too many peas. And I was like, I don't think so. You know? And she was like, you know, and she's like, oh, well, you know, you obviously did look at the play. And I was like, well, it's the same amount of scoops. And, and she's like, you know, you're an asshole and I'm, I'm a logician, like my personality type. 
is INTP, so I'm a logician. So I, you know, I don't really get emotionally invested in it. So I was like, you know, I disagree. You know, I think you're wrong. It's the same amount of scoops as, you know, the other kids got. So, like, so it really aggravated her. And um, she ended up, you know, telling me about how she cheated on me. And then she was a super miserable person for those seven years because her guilt ate at her. Um, and she would take that out on everyone else. And she would basically never be home. And when she was, she was just a nightmare to deal with. So when she ended up telling me that, I was like, awesome. Like, this is, you know, my chance to, you know, basically tell her to, to, to go to hell. And I used that opportunity to break up with her. Um, but living in rural Vermont and doing like these small computer jobs, I, I definitely didn't make a ton of money. It was it was at my own company. It was called uh, Worldwide Computer Consultants. It was a startup. Um, and just like, I didn't have a ton of money. So I was like, well, I need to make money. Like if I want to move out and I want to have a good house for my children to live in, um, I need, you know, at least 200 grand. Um, and that was my primary driving factor and my motive for, you know, becoming a dark net vendor. Okay. Oh, this really, we splashed right into it. I love it. Um, <laughs> so, it, um, yeah, we got so much ground to cover. I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to like a, a, ask questions, but um, I want to go into the future, so I, I don't really know where to go. But um, okay, so you want to just start from the beginning? No, I think this okay. is the beginning. I think we're we're already yep. splashed in. So, okay. um, the the drugs. How did you get familiar with the drugs? Um, so. Prior to, so prior to me being a dark net vendor, um, that goes back, uh, into like my history. So I had, I had been into computers and I had been into computers for about 10 to 15 years. Um, that's how long I had lived in Vermont. Now, prior to living in Vermont, I had lived in Rhode Island. Um, and prior to living in Rhode Island, I lived in Massachusetts. So like, you know, most people, they move, you know, from these states, uh, for whatever reasons, economic reasons, job opportunities, right? Um, so I was in Massachusetts. I caught uh, my first case. It was assault and battery with intent to murder. Um, and it was my first charge. And I ended up litigating it for two and a half years. Because my lawyer was like, the longer we litigate it, you know, the less it looks like, you know, he gets out of ICU and he can walk again. And it's like, you know, you didn't really do anything to him. And I was like, wow, you're incredibly evil. You know, like I might, I might have, you know, you know, been a lookout and watch this dude get smashed. Um, I was the only one that was caught for the crime. So I got two conspiracy charges too, because the two other guys that were there, I didn't tell on. So I ended up getting hit with conspiracy charges and two counts of assault and battery with intent to murder. Um, but Basically, what ended up happening was I lit we I litigated that case for like two and a half years. I ended up getting sentenced. At first, they were trying to put me in prison for ten years in Walpole, and by the end of the two and a half years, like this guy had completely healed. And um, now, when I went, like uh, the last offer that we got before going to pretrial was six months in county jail with two and a half years suspended. So I took it, and I went to. Um, the county jail in, in uh, Dartmouth, which is like county jail for like New Bedford, Fall River. It's a, it's a nightmare. Like if you look it up, I think it's responsible for a quarter of all suicides in county jails in mass. It's one of the, the worst places I've ever been as far as like a place to do time. But um, uh -huh. when I got out, like right before I got out, there's supposed to be this big gang war. So I remember I ended up taking my ID and I used the metal clip on my ID to break apart a razor blade. And then I cut like a half inch um, strip of my bed sheet. And then I wound that up and I rubbed it against my this plastic box, this big, you know, one foot by two foot by uh, two foot plastic box that you're given. And I cut through it like butter because I, I rubbed this, this, you know, this rope basically that I had made out of my bed sheet back and forth against it. And with that, I was able to cut out these pieces and I cut that into six pieces and I basically made these six plastic knives um, that were, you know, a foot each. And, you know, they're just like, I, I was like, you know, I've, I've seen people cut. I've heard, you know, heard people raped in that county jail. So I'm like, you know, I'm, I have a week left 
in that place. And I'm like, you know, I'm not going to become a victim a week before I get out. Just not going to happen. So, um, like I caught my case when I was 17, I got convicted, um, like two and a half years later. So when I got out right before I got out, I got caught making those knives, like a CO walked past me, seen them, um, you know, called SRT, which is basically like the SWAT, uh, for sheriffs. And they came in, they grabbed me, they brought me a shoe. So they brought me the shoe and they were like, you know, sign this paper that says that you're guilty of possessing weapons inside of a correctional institution. And this was like my second time going to shoe. Uh, the first time was for a lighter because I was a cigarette smoker. Um, and they like signed this paper and we'll give you a week in shoe. I had spent over a month in shoe for a lighter. So it made no sense that they would give me a week. Uh, and then, you know, you, you figure out, oh, yeah. I got two and a half years suspended. So if I sign this paper now, instead of doing six months in, you know, county jail, I'm going to do two and a half years in county jail. So I was like, yeah, I'm good. I'm not signing anything. So I got out. And when I got out, um, I had a court date with my probation officer. And I also had a court date in uh, New Bedford for destruction of property and possession of uh, a weapon inside of a correctional facility. So when I had gotten out, I had to make the choice because I'm like taking the bus, you know, I just get out of county, so I'm not on my feet. So I had to make the decision, either go to court or go to my probation officer. I elected to go to my probation officer because he's an officer of the court. And when I went there, I was like, listen, I got a, you know, I got a court date at the same time. And I don't know why it was scheduled for the same day. And he was like, yeah, it's not my problem. And I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to make it to you know, New Bedford at nine. Cause like I'm standing in his office and it's nine 30 because I got there at nine and, you know, um, and he was like, yeah, it's not my problem. I'm going to violate you. And you know, you're going to get two and a half and you know, he's make, make sure you go to your next court date. And you know, with that, I was like, yeah, okay. And I left <laughs> and I went home and I, I got, Everything that I could, you know, reasonably carry. I got a ride from a friend um, and I went to Rhode Island and I did a little bit of research and I found out that there was a law in place. I don't know if it's still in place, but there was a law in place at the time that was called the sister state law. And with the sister state law, what it said was if someone has a warrant in Massachusetts and it's not for you know, uh, murder, rape, armed robbery, or something like that, that no warrant, they, they won't extradite you. If So if I'm caught in Rhode Island, Connecticut, or any state that borders Massachusetts, if I'm caught in any of these states uh, or arrested in any of these states, they will not extradite me back to Massachusetts because you're so close, they consider it a waste of time to you know, have two sheriffs go all the way out there to pick you up and bring you back. Now that said, I've seen guys get extradited from Florida to mass and, you know, ride in a van for three days all the way up. So like it's a, it can be, it can be definitely be a nightmare, but I knew about the sister state law. So, you know, I was like, I just stay in a state that borders it and I'll never, you know, I'll never have to deal with this. And like I had, I gotten arrested in Rhode Island for, uh, possession of cannabis um, and like a vandalism charge. And each time I was pulled over or arrested, they would run my name and they'd be like, oh, Ben, do you know you have a warrant? And I would be like, no, I had no idea. And they, they'd be like, oh, well, you know, you got a warrant. And I'd be like, oh, I'll take care of that. And they'd be like, all right, you know, get out of here. Or you know, in this case, you go on, you know, you might go into the ACI, uh, which is the state prison in Rhode Island because there's no county jail. Um, so I knew that I had these warrants, but I also knew that as long as I stayed in a state that bordered Massachusetts, that I would never be extradited. And I had had this put to the test on a few occasions. So I had been in Rhode Island for a while. And um, like when I lived in Rhode Island, I sold, I mean, it's been way over the statute of limitations at this point, but I sold uh, Coke, you know, uh, powder cocaine and weed and stuff. And, uh, you know, I moved up to Vermont because I was like, I was tired of doing that kind of stuff. Um, cause like, it's a rough life, <laughs> you know, it's, it's no joke. So I moved up to Vermont. I moved up to Vermont. I got my high school diploma. 
through a program called VSAC, which is pretty awesome um, if you're just trying to get your diploma easily. Um, like you do like six projects and like one of the projects, it was like, write a 300 word essay about yourself. <laughs> like, so I did six of these menial projects uh-huh. and I, I got my high school diploma. Um, and then from there I continued on and with my education, when I came up to Vermont, I couldn't turn a computer on. Like if you were like, turn this, you know, turn this computer on, I wouldn't be able to turn it on. I couldn't reformat one. I couldn't defrag a hard drive. I couldn't do anything. I didn't know anything about it. Um, so I spent, you know, the next 10 years educating myself about computers and technology. And when I started getting into it, it was just, for me, it was an absolute, it, it was crazy. It was, it was fascinating for me, uh, the, you know, the abilities that we had, you know, uh, going online, it was never really something that I had spent time doing. So anyways, fast forward, you know, 15 years later. And, you know, now, um, you know, my ex, uh, I, you know, I break up with her and I'm like, you know, I want to be able to make money quickly. So, you know, I go and I, I, you know, I become a dark net vendor. Um, do you remember and, the first time you bought off, uh, any drugs off the dark net? Yeah. Um, so I ended up, I think it was a ounce of cannabis that I got. Um, I ended up getting it for like 150 bucks. Um, I want to say it was, I think it was from Hansa too, but I could absolutely be wrong. Um, but it was like, yeah. So for me, it was, it was something that I, I, I wanted, I had wanted to do it since Silk Road, but like I said, like with Silk Road, when it first came out, I just didn't, I didn't know how legit it was. And, um, yeah, at the end of the day, that was one thing I like when I started, I started, I was like, you know, the best ROI I'm ever going to have is when I make my own product, right? Like like a manufacturing company is never going to be beaten in price point uh, by a retailer, mm-hmm. you know? Yep. So I'm like, you know, if I'm the manufacturer and I'm the retailer, my ROI will be insane. Um, so like with my moonshine, like I could spend 10 to $14 and I could turn that into $100 at a minimum. Um and like that, and then if I made apple pie brandy from that, multiply that by five, and that was my my return it was like you know five hundred bucks. Um, but it was interesting because in order to become a dark net vendor, one of the things that you had to do on um, Hansa is like you had to you had to pay. I want to say it was like two hundred bucks. I could easily be wrong, but I could, I wanted to say it was like two hundred bucks, and. Um, they had instituted this policy, uh, Hansa did. So like I had hopped on their site and I was on their site for a while. Um, and when I decided I want to become a vendor, I started making posts. So I had 10 to 15 years of like information security and, and cybersecurity experience. So like learning about OPSEC um, really was kind of, was kind of second nature for a lot of the stuff that you're already going to be doing in information security. Um, so I remember starting to make posts and like how I ended up establishing my name was just helping as many people as I could and calling out the people that I knew were scammers. So, you know, you had a ton of people obviously that are on that forum or any dark net forums that are trying to get people to conduct transactions with them outside of the escrow system. So, you know, someone's like, oh, like I'm looking for this vendor. He had pound, he had a pound of weed, oh, hypothetically, he had a pound of weed for 1200 bucks. You'd see, you know, some shark come in and be like, oh, I like, I have his weed and I bought it in bulk and I'll sell it to you for 600 bucks a pound. And like, this guy is just a random person. Like you never uh-huh. get anything. He's just, he's there to rob you. It might even be a fed and he's just there to try to get your address, you know? Um, and he'll rob you too, you know, but he'll, he'll get your address too. <laughs> um, so like I used to call those people out. Like if you're if you said that to someone on the forum, you're like, oh, like I can beat his price. And like you don't have that vendor star, or like you can't prove that you're a legit vendor. Like you can't provide a signed PGP message saying you're vendor X, Y, and Z from this market. Then I'd be like, dude, like you're a fucking fraud. You know, like you're trying to rip this this dude off, you know, and and like 
like they used to hate that uh because i would call them out and i made five thousand posts in a month on hansel wow. and that was how i established my name and by establishing my name on just one market when hansel you know eventually was taken down um when it was taken down like and we went to other markets people knew me and like it worked out so well that like you know you don't have to pay that vendor fee but with me, that vet because I had I had I had written so much. Hansa came out with a policy, and they said in order to talk on our forums, I don't know if they did this because of me, but they like, in order to talk on our forums because I wasn't a buyer at the time and I wasn't a seller. Um, I was literally just there to brand two happy times two as a brand through uh-huh. my PR work of calling out scammers and helping people with OPSEC. Um, and they made this policy where they were like, listen, you can't, you can't post on our forums unless you're a buyer or a vendor. So I was like, son of a bitch. So there was a, there was a big Carter. I want to say it was CCM. Forget his exact name. CC cloud or something like that. But, um, uh, he had, he had sent me, he was like, listen, man, like, you know, I know like you like being on the forums, you do a lot of good. He was like, if like, if you, you know, are you going to buy something that way you can stay on the forums? And I was like, well, like, I understand, you know, I understand Bitcoin and all that, but like, I'm not completely sure yet that if I hop on like local Bitcoins that I can buy Bitcoins and have it be completely anonymous. And for me, that's a major risk. I didn't tell him I was considering being a vendor yet. Um, but like that, that was my intention. Like if I go and I buy Bitcoins and, you know, I spend it on something, then people can associate, you know, me with that address, you know? And if I become a vendor, they just figured out who a vendor was by osmosis. So it, to me, it was like, you know, it's not worth the cost of being able to post in the forums. So I was like, oh, it's a bad hit. Like I'm not going to be able to post in the forums. And he's like, no, nah, man, like I'll send you some Bitcoin and just like buy a, you know, buy a, yeah, that's right. That was my, so that technically that was my first purchase on the dark net was a stolen credit card. So he had sent me the money for it. I had bought it off him as two happy times. And then once I bought it, I was now a buyer so I could talk on the forums. So I'm like, yeah, I solved that problem. You know, that's, that, a- that's awesome. So uh, and then I sent him his, his card back because I'm not a fraudster. Like you know, I'm I'm a I'm a drug trafficker. So and I'm a Libra. So everything has to be equal, right? Like I, yeah. I can't I can't steal from someone because then it's like, you know, I'm I feel like I'm morally bankrupt because I'm not giving them something worth value in return. At least with being like a drug trafficker, we have that even exchange, right? Um. So I sent him like his stolen credit card number back. I was like, here, man, like, I don't need this. I'm not going to do anything with it. Like, I'm, I'm good, you know? Um, so I was like, sweet. Now, you know, I could post on the forums, though. So I kept posting on the forums. And then, you know, about a month or so later, it was like, um, they, like, I wanted to become a vendor. And so I go to, like, become a vendor. And, uh, like, he was like, hey, listen, man, like, you know, if you want to become a vendor, I'll like, I'll front you that 200 bucks to do it. Cause I know you don't want to go buy Bitcoin and, and you're, you know, you're, you're paranoid. You call me paranoid about it. I was like, yeah, all right. Like, that's awesome. You know, I appreciate you, you know, like, like sticking your neck out, like it's 200 bucks and he probably makes that in an hour. But that's, I thought that was really cool that we had that sense of community with this guy. Like we've never met, we don't know each other. It's like, You know, when you know someone in IRC, but you've never met them. And like, if you tell like your average person, oh, I know this guy really well. You know, we, I've known him for 10 years and like people like, oh, like, you know, like you out to eat or like, what do you guys do? (laughs) Oh no, I I never actually seen him. Like, I don't even know what he looks like. I don't know like his race. I don't know what his voice sounds like. I I don't know anything about him, but like, you know, I know his intellect, you know? Um, yeah. I know how this dude would go about owning a system. You know, I know, you know, his, his methodology for finding vulnerabilities. Like, you know, you know, these super convoluted and complicated things about him, but like, you know, you don't know what his favorite clothing brand is because like none of the, that stuff 
is relevant on the internet. You know, like, you know, well, back then, like, you know, you, you were judged by your mind, you know? Uh-huh. Um, and I think that was, that was really, to me, that was kind of like the golden age of, of the internet. Anyways, I digress. So go yeah, so, back. Go ahead. But let, let me just catch up to where we are here. So you, uh, you're, you're, you're struggling at home. Uh, you're just at the brink. How old were you at the time when you, when you made a uh, vendor account? Well, um, I don't know. Yeah. I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah, it's like it's not teenage years. Oh, yeah. No, no. Um, so it's probably like, you know, 30, 30 to 33, maybe at the earliest, yeah. 29 to 33. That's interesting because a lot of people do get started here as teenagers um, selling to their school or whatever. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So yeah, for sure. And I think I think uh I think like having an adversary for law enforcement, having that adversary that's a teenager kid, um, compared to, you know, a man who's went to university uh for like cybersecurity, graduated, now he works for like Department of Homeland Security, um, or he works for like, you know, one of these cyber task force, like kind of going after a kid, you know, is like it's kind of laughable, but like that's that's you know kind of honestly like what i like seeing is like when you have a real adversary right who knows about information security who you know employs these policies who takes six months of research to set up um it's like they say stupid cops make stupid criminals you know Uh um and you know the, the reverse is too you know stupid criminals make stupid cops and i think that's why we see like the majority of you know, law enforcement that like they, they rely on things like informants, you know, like, a, you know, a law is a, a good portion of law enforcement that couldn't function if, if people stop telling, you know, like how, how quickly do you think our rate of incarceration would drop if everyone stopped putting people in prison, you know? Um, and I'm not like, I'm not saying that there are people that don't deserve to be in prison. I've met men in prison who I wouldn't want to see in the free world because they're evil, you know? Um, and like that exists, like pure evil is a, is a thing, you know? Um, so like, I definitely, I don't think that, you know, everyone deserves to be free because it's definitely not true. But I also think, um, you know, incarcerating 25% of our population in America is absolutely absurd, especially when you're taking people who like, you know, nonviolent drug crimes and you're putting them in with rapists and murderers and you know, this dude's doing 10 years and you know he comes out and he's as hardened as those rapists and murderers so now that's what he's gonna be when he gets out you know i think it just perpetuates the system you know and then you add on you know to the fact that the 13th amendment is basically legalized slavery uh it's all you know for profit I, side issue i digress i'm going yeah. off on a ditch <laughs> yeah okay so so it's one of the things that I struggle with, because um, I actually was never a vendor or even bought <clears throat> on these net- network markets, but um, what I struggle with is getting to know the culture there, right? It's, uh, it's, it, can you talk about that at all? Like, how do you even begin to understand darknet culture? I mean, there's a lot of myths and uh, scary stuff that people sure. talk about, yep. and some of that isn't even true. So how do you kind of pierce that veil of like, I, I mean... I, I understand what, well, like you said, you know, when someone asks, how do you hack? I understand the answer to that, even though it seems like a dark uh, veil to pierce, there are so many YouTube channels. <laughs> right. Just yeah. like, here's how to hack, right? Yeah. But, I mean, I mean, even if you just, you don't even watch any, like you just, you just strictly watch DEF CON, you know, and then you got to figure, you got like InfoCon where, you know, you got like what, 700 different, you know, hacking and cybersecurity conferences that, I mean, it's it's absolutely insane when you you compare it to like you know like back in the day, and it's like oh you got frack and packet storm, you know, <laughs> and IRC, you know, <laughs> these are your resources. Um, but so like the the darknet community, I feel like really the closest thing you can really compare it to is the hacking community, um, because again, like a lot of it goes off of intelligence, but. You know, I like to 
and this is just me personally, I guess, but like I think there's a massive distinction between a hacker and a cyber criminal. Um, and you know, like that, you know, and, and again, like you have the black hat and the white hat, and you know, I've heard people be like, oh, black hats are cyber criminals. Like, honestly, I think like a black hat and a cyber criminal are even different because like the only thing that really breaks apart a white hat and a black hat is intentionality and motives. Whereas like, you know, with a cyber criminal for me, I just feel like cyber criminals, it's a much more financially driven term. Like when I think of a cyber criminal, I'm thinking of the guy who's like stealing your credit card information, you know, like this guy, he doesn't care about coding in Python. He doesn't care, um, you know, about like, you know, the, the vulnerabilities that come out, like you're not going to see him, you know, get excited about, you know, heart bleed or like, he's just like, he's, Uh he doesn't care. And like the only time he gets excited is when it's, when he can use it, leverage it for a financial gain. And I think hackers are completely different. I think, you know, when I think of a hacker, I think of someone, irregardless of their intentionality, I think of someone who, is intelligent, who is super curious, um, who enjoys learning and enjoys teaching. I think those, like all of those things kind of combined are massive characteristics of a hacker. You know, it's not like, you know, these, you know, ridiculous movies that we see like, like swordfish, this idiot has six screens and he, and he types real fast. You know, like if the definition of being a hacker is typing real fast, then like every secretary is one. Um, and yeah. it just like that kind of idiocracy, just it drives me nuts because it's really it's really demeaning, uh, especially in my opinion, especially to a community who, like I said, my my DEF CON talk, who's, you know. They, you know, they they can be there are a lot of people in it who are very intellectually, you know, dominating where they enjoy it, you know, um, and like, you know, you have an argument with someone in IRC like the joy that you know that other person gets and like you you can even have the reverse where the person who's losing gets joy out of it because they're just trolling that person but again at the end of the day like none of it is about emotions and most of it's always about intelligence um and goals but anyways um i think that both of those communities both the hacking community and the dark net um subculture are very alike in a lot of ways because you know, it's like going back to the IRC days. That's what you have on the dark net. Like, you don't know who these people are. They have handles. They don't, you know, like, you know, if you were to hop in a random IRC, you know, and you hop in and you're like, hey, guys, you know, um, and you give like your real name, like no one's going to want to talk to you. <laughs> like, uh-huh. You know, they're going to be like, you're an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, So like with that said, it's you the same that's mirrored in the dark net community, except, you know, in the hacking community, if someone breaks, you know, defaces the FBI web page or something, you know, like there are punishments for that. But like, I think the punishments that we see for the dark net community in terms of drug trafficking can be much more severe um, than that, which, you know, I mean, it's interesting because for the longest time, I, I remember seeing like a lot of hackers getting, you know, more prison time than than pedophiles, which is outrageous to me. You know, what I mean, like if if you know if you have a victim, period, like it's a completely different crime, um, especially a child or a woman. But um, so like those two, those two, a good com- point. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, like um, so like like my my view on it, um, a lot of people are like, oh, are you left, you right, and. Like, I'm like, you know, I'm neither, you know, you're not going to put me in a box and classify me, you know, why? Cause I'm a unique human being, you know, like my fingerprints unique. Why can't my views on the world be, you know? Um, so, so it, I'm just trying to kind of describe this culture a little bit. So I, uh, I you said, and not, nobody uses a real name. Right? right. And I imagine nobody's trusting each other either. They're all like a little, keep everybody at arm's, arm's length here. To a, yeah, not. To, to a point, to a point. But that can, like like anything else, that can be built um, over time. Like you can get to a point where, just like in that IRC chat as a hacker, you really trust this guy. 
And it sounds absolutely insane to anyone else. Like if you know this guy and you've known him for 10 years, I had a, a great friend of mine, um, C Wade 12 C, um, who's an admin on the site called Hacks Me. Um, he was the guy who got me into hacking culture. And like, I've never met him, you know, but I would trust him with my life, you know? And uh-huh. it's just like those kind of bonds that you have. But like, that's something that I think we will see in time in the dark net. It's something that I've experienced on a much less intense level on there. Um, So like, a uh, good example of it was there was a vendor that um, I had done business with um, importing uh, his hashish. And like we had done so much business together that like he had, I, I had earned his trust to a point where like this guy, if I asked him to send over, you know, a hundred keys, he would do it and he wouldn't ask twice. And like, again, like there's no, there's no recourse for him if I rip him off, you know? Um, this is outside of escrow. This is a, a private deal. Um, and like, I'm not putting up any money. Like he would have to trust him. Um, so like you, you absolutely can forge those bonds of friendship and trust on the dark net, but it's something that like he also knew because I'm a dark net vendor, I'm committing federal offenses too. You know, so yeah, we have like that similarity. It's like if I'm a if I'm a vendor, it's fairly easy for me to get a job on a dark net marketplace because they know I'm a criminal. They know I'm not a Fed. Like I'm shipping off coke, weed, acid, shrooms, uh, hash, Molly. You know, like all this stuff on a daily basis throughout the country. They know. And they can verify that, you know, I'm I'm not a I'm not a federal agent, you know, because yeah. So it may. So I'm trying to find some commonalities here, and maybe that's Oof. the third one is, um, everyone is criminal. Yeah, sure, but it's like you know, at the end of the day, like I've never been into an IRC and had someone be like, "Hey, man, prove your killer B. Send me a signed PGP message." <laughs> you know, there's no there's no hackers that have a canary dot text (laughs) yeah (laughs) so like you really don't know you know um but i think um the evolution of the dark that really uh really showed that like there are ways that we can even in the hacking culture that we can improve on our own opsec um through some of the natural evolutions that we've seen on the dark net like you know having pgp uh signed messages you know, Stein, you do have that, but like you know, I'm saying, it's not a, a regular thing. Like, you know, I've never, I've never had someone ask me for a signed message in a IRC. Um, oh, okay, so, so you, we're, we're working up to be becoming a vendor here, uh, and it sounds like you spent um, quite a while, um, it, like months, um, kind of understanding the whole OPSEC game and learning about other vendors and stuff. Because before you even make a vendor. Uh, account and go through the whole process you've already got quite a bit of knowledge so i'm assuming you're reading up on kind of like history and how people have um been caught in the past and right. what's worked and what hasn't worked um can you do you remember any stories that kind of stuck out to you of like oh wow i guess you should never do that or that's a lesson learned there yeah so there were there were some that were like really subtle uh, and there were some that were like really blatantly obvious like um like some of the some of the blatantly obvious ones were, I remember reading a, uh, about a case, I have no clue what his name is, but um, I remember reading about a case where this idiot had, um, he had his PGP key as a vendor, and he actually, he also used it as his Gmail um, PGP, and like, like stupid, stupid stuff like that. But then, um, you know, some of the more subtle things would probably be... Um, like just really small stuff, like the kind of the screw ups to linguistics or seeing like um, after. So, you know, Hansa, which is the, the like my first market that I really got involved with um, when I went down, they had this thing where they had the feds that took it down. I had said that, you know, supposedly they had put up in their um, and like the recovery keys for the accounts to be able to get your Bitcoin back. Um, that like those keys had malware embedded in them 
essentially. Um, and like, I never, I never saw anything from that, but like, um, at the end of the day, it's just like, no one had known that that market had been taken over by feds at the time. So to use that key, I said, like, there's a lot of vendors who did it. Um, and like, I didn't, I didn't, I was a small vendor. I didn't have any money basically, um, to be able to, you know, get screwed over on, on that. Um, when the feds took it over and then exit scammed out of it, basically. Um, but like, that was a really interesting thing. Uh, to that see. should be your, that should be your name. Exit scammed by the feds. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, so that was probably one of the, one of the, one of the things that really, I think I hated the most out of dark net vending the whole, the whole time. The thing I hated the most, because my big thing, again, like being a Libra, being, um, you know, like very, you know, being an INTP and like being very tit for tat um, was like I hated scammers and I really wasn't a big fan of the fraudsters. Um, like if you know, you're screwing over a bank or a credit card company, that's one thing. You're screwing over an individual. It's a completely different thing. Um, but like kind of seeing, um, seeing like, seeing people being screwed over and exit scammed like it it always it really aggravated me because you know those admins who create these dark net markets and then exit scam they make a certain percentage and who who knows that percentage i have no clue but like you know there's got to be a certain percentage of people who at the end of the day become more hesitant about giving some of their trust to a market um which was, you know, one of the reasons why I thought Open Bazaar was really great, which is a distributed system. That's a whole other topic. But, um, um, like when I got raided and they seized everything, and like three weeks later, you know, I got in a cell phone and I was able to hop on Dread and just see what was going on. Like I didn't make any posts or anything like that because, like, you know, I'm under indictment. You know, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to go make posts. Uh, but like I saw, like my account, Two Happy Times 2, making posts. So it's the feds who are making posts under my name. And I'm seeing people like, like you know, you know, uh, Two Happy Times 2 is exit scamming, you know, like, because uh, like they're not, they're not allowed to send drugs, the feds, you know. Um, so like that was like, if I saw a vendor account that was, you know, like with markets, it's kind of easy to see if they're exit scamming. Because all of a sudden, all the money gets locked. With vendors, it's a little bit more difficult because it's a little bit more delayed. And a lot of them will dilute that by doing like selective scams um, prior to doing full on exit scams. But I always thought like the, the people who did that were just scumbags because like you built up this, the trust of all these people. And these people that bought your product, they supported you. You know, it's like. Yeah. Like you built this relationship and even if it's just with a fake name, right? Like, like you made this name honorable by always fulfilling your obligations, you know? And then like right before you leave, you rip a bunch of people off. Like, I just thought it was, it was just such a scumbag move to do. And like, it really, I think it really kind of broke my heart, like hopping on and seeing these people like, you know, two happy times two is exit scamming. And I was like, dude, like, it's not that, you know what I mean? Like, I, uh -huh. got, a, I got a 10 count indictment, you know? Like, and like, like it, it definitely wasn't that. Like, and if I had a choice in it, I would have, you know, I would have just, I would have stopped and I would have shut it down. And, you know, I guess I, you know, we always have a choice, right? Uh, I just didn't do it soon enough. But, um. Okay, so you got started on a handsaw. Um, do you remember what you was sold for, for at first? Yeah, so it was uh, moonshine and cannabis, and and so my name. If you look up, if you look me up, like my name isn't Two Happy Times; it's Two Happy Times Two. Now, the reason that came about was because, like I said on the forums, in order to keep posting, I had to become a buyer, and once I became a buyer, their security on Hansa would not allow me to become a vendor, which makes okay. sense, right? Um, cause if like, you know, you ordered something to your physical address and your name's out there with your address, they don't want a vendor's name and address out there. 
It's actually a really good policy to have. Um, uh-huh. But it aggravated me because I just, man, I just spent, you know, like a month and a half building up this name, Two Happy Times. So now, like, I have to abandon this brand that I built. Um, you know, I made uh, 5,000 posts in, the, in yeah. the name of this brand. So what I did was I, I was like, screw that. So I ended up just going and making two happy times. And then I put the two at the end of it. And that's how my vendor name became my vendor name. Yeah, that worked. Um, so you were making the moonshine, but where were you getting the cannabis? I um, was growing it. Yep. So I had um, I had imported seeds from the EU. Um, I had gotten some uh, Master Kush seeds, and I refined them. And uh, I'd studied, so I'd studied botany for probably about fifteen years. Um, like the prior to the cannabis encyclopedia, I want to say the dude's name was what is or a I'm gonna butcher this Jorge Cervases. Um, but he had written a bunch of books prior to that, and I had read every single one of them. Um, so I learned, like, I taught myself about, like, macronutrients, micronutrients, deep water cultures, scrogs, like, all this, all this kind of stuff, um, aeration and, you know, nutrient deficiencies and how to tell, you know, nutrient deficiencies of plants. Um, and so I had, I had learned all this stuff, and I had wanted to cultivate cannabis for the longest time. Um, and then, like, you know, when... I finally, when I became a vendor, it was like, now I have a way to distribute this. Like I can make what I want because I know I have people that I can sell it to. Whereas like before, if I'm doing it locally, I have to go out and try to find, you know, someone out there to buy moonshine and to buy, you know, this this cannabis and like for me like that's a risk because now like this person knows my face what happens if they get busted you know they at least (coughs) excuse me um they at least know like the town i'm from they know what i look like they know what i drive that's an issue so like with the dark net it alleviates all that you don't have any of that um and you know so i was able to do something i wanted to do which was cultivate cannabis and you know, produce quality alcohol and um distribute it on a national level. Okay. So uh, sounds like you're on your way. You've got your vendor account, you've got a couple uh you know, pro- products you've made, which is pretty pretty smart and astute for uh for your first time as a vendor there to uh make the your own stuff. But um yeah, how'd it go on Hansa? How was your first uh, dip into the vendor pool? Yeah, so I want to say uh, on the first week, I made about 300 bucks. Um, and then the second week, it was probably about $500. Um, so like, it was definitely, it was a slow start. But had I not spent that month making those posts, I would add no sales. Um, so like, again, you don't, you know, the big, you know, one of the big rules kind of you see on the dark net is don't trust verify, right? Like, how do I know you are who you say you are? Send me a signed PGP key. Now I know. You know, a signed message. You know, now I know. um, Because I can verify that with the public PGP key that's on record at one of the markets. Um, So, like, with that said, like, you, you know, you have that that kind of verification um, when you go from one market to another. Um, And, like, I just totally lost track of where I was going with that. That's okay. I get you. <laughs> so, um, the, the OPSEC really starts to kick in here, right? Um, posting on a forum is not a big deal, uh, but now you've really got to turn it up. So, um, let's talk about the packages. Both are with, I think. Or, or I mean, so, let me, let me just walk it through here. So, you've got to have um, an account on the plays a vendor approved, um, PGP key, you've got all that. Okay, what kind of operating system or how, what was your access to the, to the, to the market? Using Tails or what was the method yeah, so, of uh, gaining access there? So initially, um, you know, like where I was at, um, the reason that my, you know, my residential company for the cybersecurity stuff that I was doing, it died out so much 
was because where where I moved to had no internet access. Um, it was a gorgeous house. Uh, it was a four bedroom, two bath on the top of a mountain. Like you could see five other mountains by looking out the windows all the way around it. It was gorgeous. You're surrounded by mansions. I found it for eleven hundred bucks on Craigslist. Um, what? Yeah, eleven hundred. Yep. That's so a typo. So, um, so if, uh, like, you know, you want to check it out, um, it's, uh, let me see if I can move the address. I want to say 1139, darling. You'd have to Google it. You'd find it in my, my, uh, Pacer stuff, but, um, it's a, it's a gorgeous house. Um, an amazing view. Like when they do 4th of July fireworks here in Vermont, you'll see people drive and park in front of that house to see it because the view's so good. Um, so it's, it's, it's nuts. Uh, but it's, it was always interesting to me because like I'm inside committing felonies. You know what I mean? Like I'm growing weed, I'm making moonshine. And like, I have 200 people outside on my lawn, you know, watching the fireworks as I'm distilling 10 gallons of 170 proof, you know, moonshine to ship to, you know, all these different states across. So like, yeah, like your, your OPSEC definitely. And like the, the thing is like sending any drugs through the mail is like, it's not tricky when you know how to do it, but it is very much it. So the difficulty in sending pure alcohol through the mail is a little bit different than, you know, mailing some weed. Cause like you got to think like, you know, the cabins in an airplane, is it pressurized? Do you know, is it not? Like if, if I'm sending a gallon of this moonshine that's in Mason jars to Alaska, how is that going to be transported? Mm -hmm. You know, how do you wrap that up? How do you make sure that like, if something does happen to it, that it doesn't leak? So like, and then how do you make it so that you don't have any overhead for that? So like, for me, one thing I came to find out was that USPS on their website, you can order free uh, supplies, right? So like, like if you want bubble wrap, like instead of buying bubble wrap from Amazon with your credit card, having it sent to your house and going through a ton of it, you can order envelopes from USPS or pick them up in person, right? And now you don't have a credit card purchase, you know? For one less of your shipping supplies. Yeah. Um, so it was like little stuff like that. So I would do stuff like that. Um, it's like, and like I would take a jar, I would make sure that it's filled all the way to the top. So when I shake it, I don't hear anything. Right. Cause if I take a bunch of liquid and I put it, fill a jar halfway up and I put it in a box and you shake it and you hear a splashing in the box, that's, you know, kind of a red flag. So like I used to fill them all the way up to the top, seal them. And then I would wrap them in a, uh, like kind of like a big sandwich bag or a freezer bag. Then I would wrap them in a, uh, one of the bubble bags for the, um, big envelopes that USPS has. And then I would take, I would order like generic, um, catalogs that were really big, like Granger or, um, uh, what's the other one? Shipping one. Um, but I would order like those, those free catalogs that had 500 to like 2000 pages in them. And I would tear out the pages, crumple them up into a ball and throw them in there. And I would pack it. So like, there's no packing peanuts. So now I don't have to buy that on Amazon. You know, like I would make sure that my expense, because you know, whatever you're sending out, that's one end that you can get popped. But like you buying supplies is just as dangerous, right? Uh -huh. So all you have to factor in all those things. And like, you know, if you can factor those things in and make sure that they have no overhead, even better, you know, cause now you're more profitable and like, you want to be as profitable as possible when you're doing this, because that's the point, you know, the, the more profitable you are, the less time you have to spend actually doing all this nonsense and worrying about these things. Yeah. Okay. So no internet, let's go back to this, right? So accessing <laughs> the website, what was the steps of accessing the website OPSEC wise? So, um, so I had to, uh, dry drove down about a, about a, I want to say about a mile. Um, and I ended up, 
I think it was Cali. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was Cali at that point. Uh, if it wasn't, it was Backtrack. But like, uh, you know, I've always been a big fan of you know uh, that distro, especially like offensive security stuff. Um, but like, um, yeah, I went and I, you know, well, I think it was Wi Fi. I loaded up and you know cracked the uh, cracked their um, their Wi Fi and. That was that. Once I had once I had access to it, I came back. I had two Yagi's um, that I used. Uh, Wait, one, so who's, whose Wi Fi did did you crack? My neighbors. Yeah. Well, okay. Not technically not my neighbors because he was like a mile away. So it was like a guy down the street. Uh huh. But like he was. So remember, I said the house was up on a hill. Yeah. So the house was up on a hill, and like a vantage point, you know, for like a sniper is up on a hill. So I was like, you know, if I can see everything that's below me, I remember I had read one time and I one of Mitnick's books, or maybe it was a movie. I thought it was a Mitnick book, but um, how he had basically reversed engineered um, a way to get a phone that had a rewritable, um, what's their, like their social security number for like a phone though. It's like a IMEI or some, something like mm, that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah, I think I, you're I right. I'm not a phone freak, so I, I don't know. But um, but like he had gotten this way where you got a developer phone where you could basically rewrite the serial number of the phone at will. And phone numbers were assigned based on the serial numbers. And that's how they tracked them. So like when he was on the run, and again, like I could have this screwed up. It could be a movie. I'm not saying this is, you know, this is fact, but the idea stuck with me. I mm-hmm. don't quite remember the source, but you know, this idea, where could it come from but besides this guy? Um, and like, you know, he had used this and he had hacked into the, the cell towers around him and pre-programmed these cell towers that when, you know, certain phone numbers were within range, he would get an alert. And those phone numbers were phone numbers that he had social engineered that were actually fed phone numbers. So basically he had like this invisible gate that was around him for three to six cell towers where if like a fed came in the area and was like 10 miles away, he would basically get an alert on his phone, letting him know. Uh-huh. And I thought that was brilliant. So I was like, how can I replicate that? You know, I'm definitely not a phone freak. I'm not Kevin Mitnick. You know, um, I, I don't even like, I don't know. I don't even like talking to people, you know, never mind like <laughs> social engineering. I'm so, <laughs> how do I accomplish that? And so I cracked this, this, you know, this Wi-Fi, and with the Yagi, I could connect to it from where I was up on the mountain, but more importantly, I could see it. So I could see this house from up on that location. And because I could see it, I was like, okay, this is my early warning system. Like, you know, they had this, the, the kind of like that running joke of like, oh, the feds drive black SUVs. And like, as someone, you know, they, sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't, but you can't really tell, you know, but like one thing you can tell is if you see 30 cars pulled up on the grass and they're pulled up all messed up, they're probably not there for a barbecue, you know, um, probably a raid. So like, you know, with that in mind, and that was because and like, that's true. Cause that's how they raided me. But, um, so with that in mind, I was like, this is my early warning system. If this guy gets raided. First off, then you know, he's good. You know what I mean? They <laughs> probably won't find anything, you know. Um, but second off, like when I see that, I know to clean house. You know, I know to grab all the drugs I have and go dump them in a river, you know, uh, and get rid of everything. Um and that was kind of like my my early warning system, you know, with that with that Yagi. And basically a Yagi, like you have an omnidirectional antenna which is an antenna that picks up Wi-Fi all around you like a sphere, like a 360. And then um, you have a parabolic antenna, which is kind of like a shotgun blast where like you shoot a shotgun and it spreads out. And then a Yagi is kind of like a sniper rifle. Um, so that's, that was the difference between those. And that's why like with a Yagi antenna, I was able to get the range that I got with Wi-Fi. Yeah, for sure. They can go pretty far. Okay, so you got on the internet that way, or step one on the internet. 
<laughs> um, and then exiting exiting tour and getting onto these websites. Was there any other, you know, additional upsec that you did? Um, so I had, uh, you know, I had tails. Um, and like initially, I didn't have tails. Initially, I had a bunch of, um, which I preferred. I had a bunch of on the actual computer, and then I had tails on a flash drive. That was pretty much how I tended to operate. Um, Again, like I do, I would do regular perimeter checks. So like, you know, probably for a day, I would walk around. I would look through almost every window in the house and just kind of look at what was going on outside. You know, was there a car parked down the street? Was it? And there were times where like I saw a car parked down the street. And um, what's interesting is like in my discovery, like one of the pictures I have they took is of my house with snow on it. and. Like, you can barely see a figure in the window. And I'm like, I always wondered, like, was that me doing my doing my security rounds? Because, like, I remember seeing a car parked about where the picture was taken from. So, like, um, yeah, Yeah. there's a there's a question. Yeah, there's so there's but there's aside from that, like, yeah, there's a ton of stuff like um, I didn't have a like I didn't have a cell phone. um, And like, you know, if you've watched a good amount of DEF CON, you know, uh, talks. Uh, like I wouldn't have a cell phone and uh-huh. I wouldn't like if you had a cell phone, like you somehow knew me and I like knew you well enough where I trusted you enough to come to my house. Like your cell phone stays in the car, you know, uh-huh. um, my wife who, uh, is an amazing person. She ended up, she got with me, uh, like we've been talking for a while, but, um, like we ended up we ended up falling in love kind of that old school hacker way where like, but for us, it was on the phone. So we had talked a lot and we had fell in love on the phone. Um, and like with her, when, um, when I got indicted, I told her, I was like, you know, I got indicted and I got 10 counts and each count has like a maximum of 20 years. You know, I was like, you know, like we can be friends, but like, we're not getting married. You know, like, I'm not, <laughs> not going to waste your life. You know, I'm going to be in prison for the rest. And like, it's not how feds work at all, but that's a, that's a, another topic. Um, yeah, again, I got off topic. What would, would you, what would you ask me? Yeah. So, um, you were using tails. So here's the question I have, right? So if you, if you load up tails, is it fresh like in the morning and then you have to, your PGP key. So, and your Bitcoin private address, like all this stuff. Yep. takes extra work to get back sure. onto Tails, right? It takes a whole like hour just to set up yep. <laughs> to yep. be able to mess, even log into the website. So how what's the what's the status there? This is always something I don't understand. So um, you know, external. Um, so I would just have a I would have my my flash drive that I would always keep on me, and I kept it on me because I also had like, you know, first off, you have to you know figure I'm I'm a, I'm a moonshiner, so. Um, you know, I, I there's there's 170 proof alcohol around me at all times. Huh. So, like, it's possible for me at any time to, you know, take this flash drive out of my pocket, pour 170 proof alcohol on it and light it, and hopefully melt it to a point where it can't be recovered. Uh-huh. Um, but really, obviously, that's not it's not a guarantee. You know, it's not like I have thermite sitting around. Um, even though that was an idea of mine at one point. Um, it's like, you know, magnesium strips are hard okay, to Okay, okay. This makes sense. So, um, you've got a way to dispose of it if you need to, and you've got an early right. warning system. I'm liking this. Yep. So, this um, this satisfies me for getting on the site. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and clearly, you have completely alternate personas from, you know, who you are because you've learned from other people using their Gmail address to set things up. So, you've got your own... Right. Email address, yep. probably at one of these more secure no, email providers. No, no, no email address. Okay, you don't need it for anything. Yeah, no. I mean, the only communication that you're going to be doing is on Darknet forums, and that's all with a signed PGP key anyways. So there's really no reason um, for you to have an email address. Um, I had Got an it. email address later on, um, and I want to say it was Proton, um, but that was for a completely different alias that I used for cashing out Bitcoin. Okay, got it. So, um, 
So now, uh, now we could talk about packages, right? So yep. what was the, um, what was kind of your research that you did to figure out how to package this stuff up? Um, so there was actually, uh, there's a lot of, turns out there's a lot of interesting stuff on YouTube um, that I had found. One, I think I want to see the name of one of the videos. So there is an ex-cop. So like a 99% of this stuff, you're not going to find on the clear net. Like OPSEC for the dark net, you really don't see a lot of this discussed on the clear net. Um, so with that said, one of the things that I found interesting that is abs- that a lot of the stuff he talked about was absolutely applicable um, was a guy who made a, he made three different movies and you could find them for free on YouTube. And I remember one of them was called uh, Never Get Raided Again. Um, and basically, he was, he was a narcotics officer. This guy was a top narcotics officer in the country. And, like, he had raided, he had raided homes. He had, like, you know, like, he, he might raid the home of a guy who's growing cannabis, right? And, you know back in the nineties or in the early two thousands and they give this guy like, you know, 20 years, you know, for growing weed. And like this top narcotics officer, like looked at it and he was like, you know, this guy didn't hurt anyone. There's no victim. This stuff, like no one's ever died from cannabis. It's a schedule one drug. It's federally, it's, it's on the same level as heroin, you know, but no one's ever died from it. Um, And he's like, you know, this guy's now he's this guy's doing, you know, 25 years. His family's completely broken apart. Uh, For what? Because he grew a a plant, you know? Um, So he basically, he walked away from being a police officer. Uh, And again, he was a top narcotics officer. Uh, He walked away from that and he ended up making these videos. And in them, he broke down a lot of the intelligence that law enforcement uses for finding, locating, and apprehending um drug traffickers so there was some of the little things that he would talk about like uh you're following a car as a cop and you see on the back left of the windshield this guy has four stickers where he donates to the police organization for him that was a red flag like really? why do you donate to the police organization you know what i mean like like, because a lot of people will do it thinking they're going to get out of the ticket or the cop's not going to pull them over. So those kind of things. The other things you would be looking for would be like, you know, a car traveling and another car is traveling behind it. But like the car that's traveling behind it, maybe it's two or three car lengths in back of it. But what we see is when the lead car switches a lane on the highway, the follow car that's two or three cars behind it goes in, and goes into the same lane. And we're watching these cars follow each other throughout these lanes and they can say, okay, so the front car is probably the drug addict who the drug traffickers paid, you know, 400 bucks to drive five keys of blow in the trunk, you know, to Maryland. And the guys in the back, the follow car are the drug traffickers that are paying them. Uh. So like these little subtle patterns that they would pick up on, Um, For things like that. Then you have things like, you know, uh, law enforcement, which is completely illegal, but, you know, they do it anyways, um, is grabbing a FLIR camera. And FLIR stands for Forward Looking Infrared. Um, So a FLIR camera is basically if I point it at, like, your house. Like, let's say you just got home, you park your car, you go inside, I pull up with a FLIR camcorder, I point it at your house, and I look at it. The things that are the coldest will be the darkest. So, for example, if there's snow on the ground, the snow will appear to be black, right? Um, Your exhaust pipe will appear to be white because it'll be super hot. Um, So, but with that FLIR camera, if I point it at your house, I can see, you know, it's like, uh, what's the best way to put it? So, if you, you know, you can't see heat with the human eye, right? It's invisible. Right. Um, but if you look at a wood, if you have a wood stove and the sun's hitting the wood stove and you look at the shadow behind the wood stove, all of a sudden, now you can see ripples. It's like looking at pavement and seeing ripples. You're seeing the heat bend the light 
and now you can see heat, right? You can see those those invisible rays coming up. Uh, I don't know what the technical term for it is, but you can yeah. see you can see the heat. So with a FLIR camera, it makes it so you can literally see the heat. Um, and if you're if you have like a grow op, like you're growing weed, a lot of people will just hook up a vent, like so the light that lights up your flowering room typically is like a high pressure sodium light. Um, and it gets very, very, very hot. And if you don't ventilate it with an inline fan, it'll catch fire. So a lot of growers will hook up these inline fans and then they'll pump that hot air outside. So if I drive past your house and I look at it with a FLIR camera and I see hot air is being pumped outside, I could be like, all right, uh, you know, maybe you're just doing laundry. I do it again the next day. I do it again the next day. Now, I came by your place four times. I looked at your place four times with this FLIR camera. Again, totally illegal, but they do it anyway. Um, <clears throat> now I see every time I come through, hot air is being pumped out of your house. Okay. So what I do is I turn around as law enforcement. They turn around and they pull your electrical record. And they see that you have spikes in your electrical usage for 12 hours a day, which is the same flowering period as cannabis use. They start putting all these little things together. Now we're going to pull your purchases and we see that you bought $600 worth of nutrients from Amazon. We see that you bought 10 submersible pumps. You know what I mean? It's a pretty safe bet that you're growing hydroponics. And like after a while, they can build up on this until a point where they have enough reasonable suspicion that it turns it into probable cause. And then once they have that, they have the ability to go apply for a search warrant, raid you. And again, all of this started with something illegal. Yeah. Now, I'm pointing this that for a camera. Barry Cooper, right? Huh? Barry Cooper is the guy who made those videos. I don't, I don't ever get busted. That could be him, yeah. I don't know. I don't want to tell you the wrong name, man. If you yeah, look okay. it up, uh, you'll see it. All right. Um, yeah, so I was hoping you'd tell me a story about um, trying to figure out what the, what the cops think is a suspicious package. Yeah, so um, so uh, just real quick. So the so him, that guy, uh, with, with his kind of um, view on narcotics officers and what they look for was really insightful. Then the other place that I think is the, the best source of information was on the dark net itself, um, just by like, it's like, you know, if you don't know Spanish, but you watch Telemundo for 45,000 hours, you're probably going to know Spanish, right? Uh -huh. So it's osmosis. You kind of learn it by osmosis. And like a lot of the stuff I learned, the specifics about packaging and stuff like that was learned through this process of osmosis on the dark net, reading on forums and, and seeing what people say, what people don't say. And the point of views that people have and kind of taking all of that in. And like um, like Bruce Bruce Lee says, take in what's useful and discard what's not. That's kind of the end of the day. Like if you're, you know, if you're looking at making, you know, a forward plan for OPSEC or a good information security policy um, as a vendor, like that's the best way to go about it in conjunction with whatever you can find um on the clear net um in addition to like those cases because in those cases you know you look at like dark net news like you're gonna you're going to see um exactly how those vendors got caught you know um and at the end of the day like there's only again going back to the whole thing with law enforcement there's only so many tricks that they have up their sleeve right um uh -huh. it's like uh you know a magician only has so many magic tricks. A uh, comedian only has so many jokes. You know, a football team only has so many different plays. So, but if you know them all, you can anticipate what their move is going to be. And if you know how they operate, you know what their next move is going to be and you can counteract it. And like, that's why I think, you know, in conjunction with kind of all that kind of 21st century stuff that we talked about from the YouTube videos to the dark net information, then go all the way back to like Sun Tzu, right? I mean, as hackers, you, know, you got to throw that in, you know, read yeah. Sun Tzu, right? <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, 
there's that. And then there's also like, you know, um, uh, Green, I think his name's Alan Green, you know, the 49 laws of power, all those kind of things I think are essential, you know, because if you know how human beings operate or you know, you know, what to expect, then, you know, you can kind of plan out what's going to happen and, you know, to your, to the best of your ability anyway. Um, so I'm sorry, what was your, what was your other question? Uh, the, um, suspicious package. It's an interesting little anecdote you talk yes. about, um, figuring out this. Yep. Um, so what's crazy is that I didn't know, um, until I figured it out, um, again, and a lot of my inspiration was drew from a Mickner book when he talks about, um, you know, basically social engineering, the operator of the national criminal, you know, database, uh, to run searches for him. Like he's pretending to be law enforcement. Um, and because he uses the terminology they use, like I need a DECWI search run on, you know, because he knows that terminology DECWI, like they automatically assume that he's legitimate, but it's only because he's read the manual, you know? And it kind of goes back to that old school hacker motto of like RTFM, you know? Um, and I think when you do that for anything, you are immediately empowered, right? It's like, if you want to learn about, you know, I want to, I want to be a, uh, you know, a master of Linux. I want to be a master of Windows. I want to be a master at Python. Like, you know, go grab an O'Reilly book, right? Um, or whatever, you know, like grab, grab that manual and go through it. And you're going to be, you know, way more empowered than you are just hopping on trying to figure, figure stuff out. So like, for me, that was like the, um, the postal inspectors manual and like, you know, they're their policies and practices and all of that kind of stuff is it was public um and like but going through and seeing it now it's like i know what the feds are doing but here's 50 other things they could be doing but they're not you know they're just not smart enough to see this you know but like i'm planning for my adversary so like i'm looking at things that they might do and like you know a lot of stuff in there like they make it almost so that they can classify any package as suspicious, right? So like they'll classify something as suspicious, but it, you have to have more than just suspicion, you know? Um, you have to have reasonable suspicion, but in order to apply for a search warrant, you also need probable cause coupled with that reasonable suspicion. So like, it might be like, you know, um, you know, this package is reasonably suspicious because it has excessive tape. Um, and we have probable cause because there's white powder leaking out of it, you know, so then they would go and apply for a search warrant to open it and, you know, it'd be probably be granted. And then once it's opened and they do like a field test on it, oh yeah, it's Coke. All right, cool. Like now we're going to look at the videotapes if that post office has cameras, um, or we're going to pull traffic surveillance and we're going to see, you know, the license plates of the people that drove around there. Uh, and try to match them up with the person that shipped that package out. Then they'll do surveillance on the house. So like, but like going back to what you were saying, like making a package safe to ship was actually, it's kind of difficult because they try to make it as generic as possible so that they can classify almost any package as suspicious. So like if you use quote unquote, too much tape, what's too much tape? Well, that's arbitrary. It's up to them. So, like, if you use too much tape, if you have a fake return address, if you have a handwritten address, um, if it's not an official USPS box, right? Like, um, all of these, you know, a fraudulent return address, a fake sender address, like, all of these things culminate to create a suspicious package. And then pairing them together makes it so you can add up these individual variables to, you know, make it something where now you can say you have probable cause and plead that case to a federal judge and hopefully give him, you know, he'll bring you a warrant to open it up. So like, you know, when you're, when you're preparing to try to fight that, you are making sure that you're aware of all of those things that they can possibly do and you're having countermeasures to them. And then you have to factor in too, like, you know, at the end of the day, if I go print off your address on a regular inkjet printer, you have micro printing. 
my IP address is going to be in that, that label. What about um, which, which um, um, carrier to use? Oh, for um, packages? Shipping, yeah. USPS only. Why? Um, because it's run by the federal government, which means they require a warrant to open it. Um, if you ship DHL, UPS, um, FedEx, any of those are private companies, they can open your package at will. Whereas with USPS, they require a warrant uh, and they need reasonable suspicion with probable cause in order to apply for that search warrant and have a federal judge sign off on their ability to even open that package. Okay, so when you're shipping these things, are you um, calling the, <laughs> you know, the, the, is, it the, is the mailman coming to your house and picking these things up? And, and you're like, oh, here you go. I got a whole bunch more packages. Or what's the uh, <laughs> process here? And, and are you using a real name or what? Um, so so the, the process for that, uh, essentially... Absolutely not uh, from the house. Um, so in the in the Department of Homeland Security investigation that was conducted, the only thing that the Department of Homeland Security knew about me and the post office knew about me um, was that I worked with computers. Um, so by the time they actually investigated me, the only thing my local post office knew was like, yeah, he's a computer guy. He fixes his computers and works on computers. And like, that's a result of good OPSEC mixed with, you know, having a good cover. And those two things are completely different. You know, uh, with a cover, you can employ deception, right? Uh, with OPSEC, you don't. So like, anyway, side issue. Um, so going back to that, so how we would ship them is, initially I was going to ship them all myself. Um, and so I'm at this point, like I'm, I'm cultivating cannabis. I'm, you know, uh, producing moonshine and, you know, I'm starting to, I, I've, I've already at this point, I've studied also mycology, which is the art of uh, well, science of, of fungus, fungi, um, so that I can do things like agar transfers and, and um, practice proper sterile technique in order to cultivate hallucinogenic mushrooms. So. Like as my business grows, so does my knowledge and my diversity, you know, my, my portfolio constantly evolves in different things. Um, and typically those things come from intellectual stimuli, right? So learning how to learn about botany, learning about distillation, um, you know, learning about, you know, uh, sterile technique, uh, all those kind of things. But so as things evolve, I don't have time to ship packages. So um, I had reached out to my cousin. And like I could talk about this. She was indicted too. Um, so it's all a matter of public record. None of it's secret. Um, but so I contacted my cousin who at the time lived in Rhode Island and she worked at a dead end job. And I said, hey, listen, like, um, you know, I got a plan. You know, you want to come up for a weekend uh, and I'll talk to you about it. And she drove up that weekend and I told her, you know, cause I'm not, I'm not going to talk about selling drugs on the internet over the phone. You know? Um, yeah. <laughs> I might as well just hit up, you know, call the NSA and let them know. You know like, uh -huh. uh, but again, that's, that's kind of a fallacy too, because I really haven't in my, my, you know, uh, research, I've never seen really intelligence agencies cooperating with law enforcement. You know, like I just, I've never seen like the NSA contact the FBI or the DEA or the ATF or the, the Department of Homeland Security. Like, hey, you know, this guy's selling pounds of weed, you know, like they just they don't care. You know, uh, uh -huh. they really don't seem to care about anything except for data collection. Um, so anyways, going back to uh, the top of your hand. So I told her about it and I said, listen, like how it'll be is like, I will pay you a you know, a certain percentage, 5% of whatever I'm shipping out, 5% of that profit margin for that package is yours. Um, plus a standard fee, we'll do like $5 a package, plus the percentage, plus gas money, all the expenses, car payments, um, and we had a spare bedroom. So she, if she wanted, she could live there. 
Um, so she had very well taken care of. Um, plus, like, you know, unlimited alcohol, moonshine, weed, shrooms, ecstasy, acid, like basically whatever you want, you could take, you know? Um, so that was kind of the arrangement that I had. And then she would go and I would, in the morning, I would wake up, I would check my orders, I would print out addresses um, on thermal labels because thermal labels don't use microprinting, which means my IP address won't be on that label. Explain that. So if I print out, if I print out on an envelope right now to send you a letter um, with microprinting, they'll, your printer will put your IP address into that text. You won't see it. You have to zoom in. But you have a thing called microprinting, and it's a security thing where, like, if I kidnap you and I send a ransom note and I printed it out with a printer, like, they can see the IP address inside of the text that the printer used to print. Wow. So when you're going to ship, like, this is kind of the level that you're looking at, you know, as far as, like, operational security. So for me, um, I would, I, I bought a thermal printer. Because with a thermal printer, it doesn't use ink. Um, it basically just comes in strips and it prints, but it doesn't use ink. It uses thermal paper and there's no micro printing with those. So in the morning, I would wake up, I would print out, um, like, let's say I'm sending you, you know, half a pound of weed. I print out your address and on the back of it, I write half a pound of weed. Um, so I throw it into like a little bucket that I have. Then I go upstairs and each bucket is organized for each drug. So I know when I go to access my cannabis and I package my cannabis, I'm packaging all my cannabis orders for the day. And what I do is I pick it up. I see, okay, uh, you know, here's, you know, here's Jack's name and his address What's Jack ordering? I flip it over half a pound of weed. I package up a half a pound of weed. I have it sealed up in my clean room. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I have it sealed up in my clean room. And I package it. I have, you know, my fake return addresses. Slap it on there. Then I peel it off. And I slap your destination address on that box. And I throw away the backside of the label, which says half a pound. Uh -huh. So now you are guaranteed to get the product that you ordered. Okay. I know you're not going to be sent the wrong item. Um, and like, I know like my, my printing's on point. So like you can, you know, with, with sending out a package, for example, if your fingerprints or on the outside of a package. So like one of the things my cousin was concerned about, she was like, if I'm sending out these packages and like the FBI fingerprints them, they'll see my fingerprints. I was like, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's, it's not false. It's true. You know? And she was like, well, you know, like that's kind of an issue, right? I was like, no, because at the end of the day, if you're at the post office and you touch a box, you have, you still have plausible deniability. Right now, if your fingerprints are inside one of those, you know, the plastic that seals the drugs or on the inside of the box, not so much. So um, for me, I would seal the package because I'm working with it on the inside of it. I would seal it and I would have like, you know, two or three pairs of latex gloves on. Um, and I had a shorter beard at the time. But, um, you know, if I had hair and I wouldn't shave my head. I would have had a hairnet, um, but like I bleached the area that I did it in on a regular basis to make sure there's no, you know, DNA. Um, like there's a ridiculous amount of stuff that kind of goes into this and then actually packaging it up. So let's say I'm packaging up just an ounce of weed. Um, I'm taking, I'm taking a sandwich bag. I'm putting, you know, the cannabis in there. I'm sealing it up, getting the air out as best I can. And then I'm taking that and I'm wiping it down with rubbing alcohol with a new pair of gloves. 
And the reason I have to do is a new pair of gloves is because at the end of the day, that those that the THC is microscopic. So like if there's even the smallest amount on a layer that is exposed to the air, if there's a dog around, that dog can alert to it. Okay. Um so what I would do is I would take the package and I would I would seal it up in a in a like a sandwich bag or a freezer bag, get as much air out as I could, then I would wipe it down with rubbing alcohol. I would stick it inside a vacuum seal bag. I would vacuum seal that bag. And then I would dip that whole bag in a, in a solution of rubbing alcohol, let it dry off. Then I would seal it in another bag. And then the last bag that I would seal it in would be what's called a visual barrier. And a visual barrier is just a, it's a vacuum seal bag that's a solid color, so you can't see through it. So I would vacuum seal this last bag and I, off my thermal printer, I would print off a label that says organic dried fruit. And I would slap it on that visual barrier. Now, if I hand this to you, you look at it and you squeeze it. It feels like dried fruit, but you can't uh-huh. see it because the visual barrier. So if law enforcement or a postal employee was curious about what was in a box and stepped on the box to look inside of it, oh, it was an accident. We didn't you know we stepped on the box by accident. You can step on this box all day and that visual barrier is not going to, it's a visual barrier. So you could literally open the box and what you're seeing is just this thing that says organic dried fruit. You have to open this box and cut through this, you know, two mil thick plastic in order to get the other plastic out. And even then it's still so opaque that you can't see what it actually is. So you have to go through all these layers to see what it actually is. Now, the reason I would do that is because you have a thing called permeation. So I can take a pound of weed, I can put it in a bag, I can stick it in a PVC pipe, and I can stick it in a block of concrete, stick that block of concrete in a gas tank, and if I leave it there for long enough, a drug-sniffing dog will smell that smell of that cannabis through the metal of the gas tank, the gas in the tank, the concrete, the PVC pipe, and the plastic bag because it permeates out right? Because nothing in this world is actually solid. It's all held together by atoms, but nothing is technically solid, right? Even the inside of an atom is, you know, comprised of basically nothing, right? But empty space. So permeation goes through everything and anything. Some substances, it takes longer. Now, mind you, I don't have to put it in concrete or steel or any of this crazy stuff that you see, like, a lot of the cartels do that, that are shipping you know, large quantities, because at the end of the day, I use two to three day shipping, you know, and it's sealed in four layers. So it doesn't have time to permeate those bags uh, in order for a dog to be able to smell it. And I can assure you there's no microscopic residue on the outside of it because I've changed my gloves and I've killed whatever it is with rubbing alcohol and completely cleaned it multiple times on that same package. That's that's really informative. Thank you. I love that. Um, so you gave your <laughs> you gave all these packages to your cousin, and she would drive them to work, like into so, town. And- so so what would happen was um, every so the, every three packages would have a different return address. Um, so I would maintain a list, um, and the list was like a list of counties, and in the counties, you know, you have towns. So what I would do is I would pick a county. It could just be at random. I'd pick a county off this list and I'd say, okay, this town, this town, this town, this town, this town. And then from that list, I now have five different towns. Now in, you know, rural Vermont, not, you know, not every, some towns are actually villages and not like, so yeah, it's just, it's, so from each one, what I would have to do is one of the alerts for law enforcement is a fraudulent return address. So I had to find a database of legitimate return addresses. And like, you know, me, like, if like you're an honest guy, right? Like you're an honest citizen, you're nine to five guy, you don't break the law. You're not, you know, you're not evil that I know, you know, like, so like, I didn't want to send out, you know, a bunch of Coke with Jack's return address. Um. Because if I did that, you know, you might 
you know, it might not be the best thing. Like Department of Homeland Security busts down your door at 6 a.m. You miss work or someone tells your boss about how they saw you getting raided. You lose your job. You know, what are you going to say? Oh, I didn't do it. Everyone says that, you know, um, and like the stigma, the trauma that your kids are going to have, like, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes hand in hand with it. Um, so like for me, I needed a list of people that I could find and I needed this list to be of people in every state, every county, every town. And I needed their sh- you know, street address. I needed their real name and I had to be a legitimate address. And like my um, solution for that was looking at the sex offender registry and finding like level three sex offenders, the worst sex offenders, and, you know, putting their name as the return address. And what this did was it made it so it was a legitimate address, a legitimate return address where I could be pretty sure, you know, not guaranteed, but <coughs> excuse me, reasonably sure that kids didn't live at and that, you know, if this guy got raided, I, I really didn't care, you know, cause I have no sympathy for, you know, chomos, like this, what they call them federal person, like child molesters or pedos as they call them on, you know, the dark dad and everywhere else. Um, so, uh, you know, I was like, at the end of the day, like, you know, I, I it was, it was a great list to have because no matter where I'm shipping from in the country, there are sex offenders. Um, yeah. and I didn't feel guilty about using them for my nefarious purposes, you know, because at one point they had used someone else for their nefarious purposes, you know? Huh. Um, and I just kind of saw it as karma. Um, so. I would print out with each package, each package. So each post office at a maximum would have three packages going out, right? So, you know, if we were shipping nine packages that day, she would probably be visiting three or more post offices. So our our maximum was three packages per post office. So she would go, she would, you know, ship out these packages from these three different post offices. She would get receipts and she would bring them back and I would cross off the name of that town. Um, And then the next day I would pick a different county, right? And that's how I rotated. But it's also how I ensured that I did not visit that same post office for at least six months. Because I figured, you know, if the feds are going to, the feds, you know, let's say we ship out this package from this post office. The feds catch it. And they're like, well, we didn't get any video footage. Like, So we're going to set up shop. We're going to do surveillance. That's what they do, right? We're going to set up surveillance at this location. Have fun, because we're not going to be back for six months. <laughs> How big is your budget? You know, we're not, we're not sending out, you know, five-gallon buckets of fentanyl. In fact, like the most dangerous, the most harmful drug that I, I shipped I think was alcohol. Other people would say was powdered cocaine. Um, I think I honestly, I think alcohol is worse, uh, even though it's legal. Um, but like I didn't sell heroin. I didn't sell mess. Uh, I didn't sell meth. I didn't sell fentanyl. Um, I tried not to sell drugs that I thought took people's souls. I tried to sell what I consider to be party drugs. Um, and again, people would be like, you know, that's, that's, you're just trying to, uh, you know, rationalize your bad behavior. You could absolutely say that. I wouldn't contest it. I wouldn't say it's wrong. You know, that's what it is. But at the end of the day, like, for me, that was my moral line, you know? And I was proud of myself for even having one because there's a lot of guys that don't, you know? <laughs> yeah. I wonder what, um, so, so you had a moral line of which drugs you would sell and which ones you wouldn't. Right. And whose return um, addresses. Um, yeah. Any other moral them. lines? Um, like, is there somebody he wouldn't, you wouldn't sell to you? Well, so that's the thing, right? Everyone's anonymous. You know, it's kind of like, um, it's kind of like if I sell a knife on Amazon, how do I know you're over 18? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you really can't tell. Um, right. I mean, and, and not only that, man, but you have, uh, you know, you know, for the people like, well, you know, you're selling dangerous drugs. Okay, you're gonna tell me that no child's ever been prescribed oxycon. Yeah. At, at least I'm not in a position of trust. 
right? I'm not your family physician. Like, it's like having a soccer mom come to you and trust you. She got tennis elbow, right? So she just doesn't play tennis for a few days. She'll be good. And like, you know, a doctor to try to make it feel like he's actually done something and to justify his, you know, what he's going to charge her, you know, prescribes Oxycontin and she becomes hooked. Like, this is not a far-fetched story, right? Right. This is a fairly common story. And that's, you know, it's my, I'm of the opinion that that's one of the reasons we have this, you know, opioid crisis here in America, because it's profitable for the pharmaceutical companies. And those pharmaceutical companies give big donations to doctors. And, you know, at the end of the day, those same pharmaceutical companies will turn around with the treatment. You know, once there's that person, oh, we can't give you this Oxycontin anymore, you know, because you're obviously an addict. Now they're going to go get heroin. And then at some point, they're going to try to get off the heroin and they're going to go with something, you know, like mescaline. Um, I'm sorry, not mescaline. Methadone, you know. Um, and they're going to be on that for the rest of their lives. Now, why? When, you know, there are studies that show that, you know, hallucinogenic mushrooms can help or completely alleviate opioid withdrawals. Well, because at the end of the day, a treatment is much more profitable than a cure. And in my opinion, that kind of premeditation is barbaric in comparison to a guy selling some weed and some, you know, alcohol on the dark net. Um, and that's, that's how kind of like I, I would justify it to myself, you know, now, is it wrong? Yeah, it's absolutely wrong because it's it's illegal, right? Um, but I was also of the belief um, that an unjust law is no law at all, you know? And I was also of the belief that all of us have an inherent right to our own bodies, you know? If you want to go eat McDonald's for the rest of your life and, you know, become 400 pounds and die of a heart attack, you're free to do so as an American, you know? Um, and I'm of the belief that if you want to do drugs, you should be free to do so. Um, as an American, you have a right to put whatever you want in your body. No, if Unless someone else owns your body, no one has a right to tell you what to do with it. It's like me telling you, you know, you can't wear your glasses over your eyes. You have to wear them on your forehead. Who am I? I have no right to your property. Who am I to tell you what to do? So that was kind of like my contention on that whole thing. I think I'm going way off topic. No, I, I, I think that's good. Um, I think it, it kind of encapsulates, uh, you know, the libertarian view and uh, Ross Ulbricht's view and stuff like that. So, Well, I think it's throw- at, at the same time, like, um, you know, it just, pro- prohibition is stupid because it doesn't work. You know, um, the war on drugs, you spend billions of dollars every fiscal quarter. And, you know, we have, we have locked up people for life for cannabis and it's done nothing. It's like, you know, you can execute people all day. Guess what? There's still going to be murders. You know, the tough on crime stance does nothing but get politicians elected. And in my opinion, like to be a doctor, you need 10 years of school. To be an architect, you need 10 years of school. To, um, you know, to to be a lawyer, you need seven years of, of college, right? You know, what do you need to be a politician? You just got to lie. <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, you just got to be willing to betray people. And to lie and to put on like this holistic attitude of how you're virtuous and wholesome. And it's just disgusting to me. It's like, you know, you'll see, you know, you see a school shooting, you see some horrible tragedy. Right. And, you know, there's a comedian who said this much better than me, but like, um, you know, you'll see these people who will hop on Twitter and, you know, they'll be like, like, oh, you know, prayers and you know wishes and my heart goes out to the victims of so and so and it's like you know when i see that post i don't see someone who genuinely cares about people who were killed uh or you know suffered some god-awful tragedy i see someone saying you know what social media is about what's it about look at me you know i see someone saying hey i know this horrible thing happened but don't forget about me uh-huh. i'm important too you know like it's just it's disgusting to me. And like, like, I don't know, just a, like, you know, you, you, when you have a prohibition on anything, you empower those who are willing to walk outside the lines of the law, you know? Um, so like, you know, we make alcohol illegal. 
well, you know, now you have, um, um, you have people like, uh, oh my God. um, who's the dude in Chicago, the gangster, Al Capone. So like you make alcohol illegal, right? And, you know, you empower Al Capone, right? To make millions of dollars off this product because now it's illegal, which means it's more profitable because it's more rare. And things like, you know, the Valentine's Day massacre happened. Yeah. I mean, I was just reading the other day about, you know, nicotine kills 400,000 people a year. Why not just make it illegal? Well, if you did, then you'd have um, dangerous nicotine in the world uh, and not, um, you know, regulated and safe and, uh, you know, store-bought stuff is going to be a lot safer than street-bought nicotine. Right. And I mean, at the end of the day, you cannot, listen, this world is not a safe place, you know? And, and like, you can try to child-proof the world for adults, but it's it's, all it's going to do is give rise to predatory actions, you know? So, like, you can say we're going to make every harmful drug illegal and what's going to happen is someone's going to come up out of that and make a black market for it where they're going to make a hundred times what they would have, you know, what it would have been had it been regulated. And not only that, when it's regulated, you know, it's in a store. So people are going, they're showing ID for it, right? Like, like no one's selling cigarettes to kids at playgrounds, right? Like, no one's going there with Lucy's trying to sell singles, sell single cigarettes. But you do have crack dealers that go to schools that hand out free crack or free heroin. Oh, hello. Okay. So let's switch gears a little bit here. Sure. Um, there was a slide that you had on your talk, which was which I want you to talk about, is uh, yes. know what your boundaries are and your goals as a darknet vendor. Yep. Um, so... For me, my boundaries were the ethical boundaries that I spoke about. Um, you know, for other guys, it might just be like not shipping to a certain place, um, which was another thing. I didn't ship internationally. I only shipped nationally um, because I didn't want to have to deal with customs. Like, I can send anything through the mail. If it's in the United States, it's not going through customs. Um, now, that said, if I don't know how to ship it properly or I fail to ship it properly out of complacency, then it doesn't matter. Um, but like the whole thing where people are like, oh, like what about drug sniffing dogs? Like drug sniffing dogs don't work in eight hour shifts. They can't. It's like try to go to a candle shop and smell candles for longer than a half hour. They're all going to smell the same. You know, so um, kind of going back to like what, what can, you know, your boundaries for me, it was like no international shipments, no selling stuff that, you know, heroin, meth, uh, fentanyl, things that kill people. Um, and, you know, not ripping people off, giving them the best quality product that I could source on a global scale, you know? So, like, the theme of my shop wasn't quality. Like, if you came and you bought from Two Happy Times to... Like, you didn't buy from me because my prices were competitive. You bought from me because I sourced the best acid or the best molly or the best, uh, you know, hallucinogenic mushrooms or cannabis or, you know, strongest alcohol or whatever. I had a boutique. Like, I sourced the best product that I could find globally. Um, and that was the point of, that was my, my kind of thing. So that was... I guess kind of my boundary was don't ever sell a cheap drug. Um, don't ever sell something that can kill people. Um, and you said boundaries and what, what else was it? Goals. Uh, so my, so my goal initially, that's a great question. Getting into my goals, like my only goal with this was to make like 200 grand. Um, Cause like in Vermont, you could buy a house for a relatively cheap, like, you can find a cheap house for like a hundred grand. So I was like, I buy a hundred thousand dollar house and I have a hundred thousand dollars left, which will let me pay the taxes and, you know, live off of it for long enough until I can 
find something to, you know, keep me afloat permanently. Um, so my goal was like 200 grand uh, starting out. But it was like between like my cousin's fee that I paid her um, and having to like upgrade my my cannabis setup and upgrade um, my alcohol um, and pay for shipping and, you know, kind of evolve with the business. Um, I always found myself always reinvesting. So like if I sold something, I made 800 bucks off of it. I would be like, all right, 400 bucks is going to be for shipping uh, fees. And the other 400 of that is going to be for gas money for my cousin to ship $400 worth of stuff, hopefully. Um, so like I made enough to make a profit, but like between my cousin and my ex who I was still living with, um, it was, I never got to that $200,000 line. Now I did get to a point where like towards the end, like your money starts to come in exponentially. So like, like I said, like, the first week was like 300, second week was probably 500. And then like I had weeks where it was nothing. Um, and then you have weeks where, you know, you got Bitcoin and guess what? Bitcoin dropped 20% in value. Yeah. <laughs> so now you got to hold that till it goes back up at least to that, at least 20%. Um, and like, I'm not a millionaire. I don't have a lot of money. So like having that being held, it kills you because now like, you know, you're eating your profits. Now, now you got to put that money that you have to hold in Bitcoin. You have to put all the rest of the money that you've made into stuff like shipping, shipping supplies. You know, oh, I need more nutrients. Oh, I need my pump died. Oh, I need, you know, this or I need that. And like, you know, you have these constant fees. Um, never mind the car payments and, you know, everything else or rent. You know what I mean? Like you still have your regular bills. So like, you have all these things and it's just like that person who works that nine to five, you know, you're on the wheel and you feel like you're not going anywhere. Right. The only difference between me and that guy is like, you know, I'm risking 30 years in prison. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm hoping that by doing that and risking more, I can make more in a shorter amount of time. Um, and it's just, it's, uh, not always the case. Um, so, so like, uh, yeah, but yeah, with, I, don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm trailing off into my own line now. So. Yeah. So one of the things he, I wrote down as a note watching, watching your show or talk is don't drink and type. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's more dangerous than drinking and driving. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. What, what, what's the danger here? Um, so like, let's say, you know, you're you're to a point now and you know we know like as people who are in security on a regular basis right on you know on the left side of the scale we have security right and on the right side of the scale we have um what's the word i'm looking for uh ease of access right um uh I don't want to say Usab complacency. Um, usability. Yeah, like like usability, right? So um so we have these two extremes and they really are. Um, you know, like if you get up, you get up in the morning and you walk outside your apartment in the city and you don't close your door. It's really easy to come back in your apartment. But it's also really easy for anyone else to, right? Like you're yeah. not gonna have anything left. <laughs> you know, some crack is gonna steal everything. So like, you know, you you're gonna be at a total loss. But like it's gonna be really easy to get back into your own apartment. So, you know, but now on the flip side of that, you have three medical locks, you have, you know, a bar that goes across the middle of the door, it's a solid steel bar, and all the windows are barred, and you have two alarm systems. With, you know, motion sensors, pressure plates, all this other stuff, you invest a ton of money. Um, now, like, you have, when you get in, you have to use 20 keys to unlock your door. 
You have to get in. You have to punch in this access code, get your retina scanned. You get all these things that you have to do. So it's it's very it's not very convenient, right? And like you know, good operational security and functionality and like information security policies. They try to find like that happy medium between secure and convenient. Yes, um, definitely. And like it's an extremely difficult thing to do. And when you get complacent, like, you know, all right, now you, you know, your first purchase on the dark new market, you're going to be, it's like losing your virginity. <laughs> you know, like, uh-huh. You're going to be super nervous. You're going to be clumsy. You don't know what to do. You, you don't know how to do it. <laughs> and, yeah. And then you, you now, you now you fast forward 20 years later and you know, Obviously not 20 years later, but 20 years, maybe in our, our metaphor or whatever you want to call it. Um, and now it's like you made 100 purchases on the dark net. You're super comfortable, right? You know what you're doing. You know how long it takes. You know how to use PGP. You know when you should ask a vendor for a tracking number or if you should ask a vendor. You know what your vendor's terms and conditions are. You know how to spot an exit scam somewhat well. You know how to tell a fraudulent vendor somewhat well. Um, and you've gotten to this point where you're kind of comfortable now, you know, and now you've been on these forums for so long. It's kind of like you saw that evolution with 4chan and anonymous where these people talk to each other for so long. They're all anonymous, but they've talked to each other for so long that, you know, how this one guy always kind of talks. He has this linguistical thing that he always does, right? He always uses a certain phrase. Or he always misspells there, you know, uh-huh. like, um, but you pick up these things about him, even though he's anonymous and you start to learn about each other, even in this anonymous setting. Now, as human beings, we have this propensity to over time, as we know someone to grow closer to them, right? Unless you're a socio or a psychopath, right? Um, like, so we tend to grow closer to the people that we've known for longer and we've been through stuff with for longer. Well, like if you're on the dark net, for any prolonged period of time, and get like there's an exit scam, and you're yeah. a customer, and you get robbed. Like there are other people who got robbed too. That's a bonding experience. <laughs> to some degree, you all got robbed together. And like what I tend to notice with human beings, the worse stuff you go through together, the closer the bond. So like if me and you go out to a club together, or like we meet each other at a club. And, you know, we become friends, we talk, you know, boom, boom. We'll have a, you know, relatively close, you know, maybe relationship, right? But that friendship might not last that long. Now, if me and you sign up and we go to our rock together, right? Or, or you know, we're both in prison and we're, you know, we, we're, you know, fighting for our lives because it's a big ass, you know, war or whatever. Like when we get out or we get out of that war, or we get out of prison, we're going to have an extremely close bond. Yeah. And those are bonds that in some cases can last a lifetime. So the more you go through with someone and the worse it is that you go through, the closer the bond, you know, it's to some degree. So at some point, uh, Reddit banned Darknet Market, and then uh, I think Dread was created just then. Yes. Were you involved with Dread? Right. Yeah. So, um, so like, uh, even, even before that, what were we, what were we just talking about? Um, don't drink and type. <laughs> oh, so to get to your point, like the point of not drinking and typing is what happens is that complacency. So you get comfortable at a certain point with me, just like me and like, me and you might know each other in year for years in IRC, right? And then you get wasted one night and, you know, I call you by your handle and you say, oh, no, nah, man, it's cool. Just call me Jack. Okay. Right. And it's like, you know, in that situation, but on the dark net, right? Um, where like I very well could be a fed. Now I know something. I know an identifying piece of information about you. And maybe I've seen you say something a certain way that's unique to a certain area. Now I know what your first name is and around about where you are. Um, and as time goes on, like there'll be more information leaks that I can capitalize on to figure it out. And that's why I said to answer your question. That's why I said don't drink and type because whatever complacency you have 
is exponentially increased, which means the chances of you basically being a data leak on yourself increases exponentially with that. So give me a quick um, rundown of some of the some of the roles you've had here on Darknet Markets, right? So 5,000 posts just as a, as a contributor, yes. um, a buyer, a vendor, um, dread admin, a PR for another Darknet market. Go on. Um, so, yeah, PR and then um, also uh, um, arb- like arbitration. So like arbitration. Um, Dispute resolution. So basically, when you would have a customer who would dispute a sale um, and you would have a vendor who would either agree or dispute it, mm-hmm. then I would I would manage some of the, sometimes on some of those markets, I would manage those disputes. Um, and I would be the one to decide, like, do you get a refund? Do you not get a refund? Do you get a percentage? Of a refund, like how how is that figured out? And we would do that by looking at, you know, obviously the reputation of both the buyer and the seller. Um, oh, we would also look at like the account age. We would look and see if like they had accounts on other darknet markets, how reputable they were. Um, and then there were like there were some like there were some of them that were very easy because like you know, someone who puts in a, uh, you know, they put in to buy something and five days later they open a dispute and it's like, you know, this uh-huh. isn't Amazon, you uh-huh. know, well, next day shipping. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, there are vendors that have it. Don't get me wrong. They have express shipping, but like, I'm not granting your dispute, you know, cause you haven't gotten in five days. Like you're going to wait. And if you don't want to wait, then if this vendor is cool with it, he can give me your tracking number and I'll look into it and see if he actually shipped it. And if he did ship it where it is, or like, you know, you should be asking if he's cool with giving it up, yeah. then you should be asking, for it, you know? Um, so there was a lot of ways to figure out disputes, but like you do have those ways where it's like, he sent me this box. I got it in 10 days. The box was full of rocks. Uh-huh. Okay, do you have pictures of the box? Did you video the opening of it? No. All right. Um, like in that case, I have to look at their reputation and it might just be like, you know, kind of like that story in the Bible where you, you know, you, you, know, you, you know, cut the baby in half, you know? <laughs> um, so it's like, <clears throat> depending, again, depending on reputation of the vendor, reputation of the buyer, you take that into consideration. But like, you know, as a darknet vendor, you should have your terms and conditions so solid that that's not even, it's not up for, you know? Yeah. Um, like, I know I would ship without tracking. Um, like, if you wanted, like, you know, an eighth of weed or something, or like a gram of Coke, I would be like, hey, listen, like, I can ship with tracking or without. It's a really small amount. But in my terms and conditions, if you don't want to pay the extra $10 for shipping and I'm sending it without a tracking number, you have no ability to dispute. Would you have the tracking number? You just didn't give it? No. So like, uh, I wouldn't have it. I would, I would mail it with just, um, with just stamps. So like Uh. I might take it and like break up your cannabis, compress it into a flat, almost like a dollar and seal it up with the plastic bags and put it in a literal white envelope put some uh, stamps on it and mail it out. Now your shipping is one to two bucks instead of 10 to 15 bucks, but you don't know when it's going to arrive. And if it doesn't arrive, it's not my problem Uh because it's clearly stated in my terms and conditions that if you elect to have it shipped this way, then that's on you. And I have multiple ways of, of shipping. So you could have had that insurance and had it guaranteed. Now, if you elect to have shipping, um, tracking then when i ship if you're like hey man it's been 10 days i didn't get it first thing i'm gonna do is i'm gonna look up that package and i'm gonna say oh okay it's being held right now or like it was delivered on the 23rd at 10 15 and it was left on the porch well i didn't get it well that's not my problem 
Uh huh. If it's delivered, it's delivered. It's up to you to supply a legitimate delivery address where you can get a package. So if you don't get it, that's on you. Now, if it was never delivered, um, that's totally different. Like now, because it's not delivered, I'd be like, okay, you get two options. I'll either resend, like, you know, you bought half a pound of weed. I'll resend you another half a pound of weed, completely free. No charge for shipping, no charge for the product. I'll resend you the full purchase at a different address or with a different name, or I'll give you 50% of your money back. But you make okay. that choice. Yeah, that's good. Um, the, 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 I've interviewed a few other um, darknet vendors. For, and I'm always like, man, I wish you were my hookup. <laughs> everyone, everyone's got such like, you know, specific, like very, I don't know, they're very careful and calculated. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you just imagine buying something from some wacko and nothing comes right and it's all trash. Yeah. Yeah. And never mind the fact that, I mean, you don't know if this douchebag sprayed fentanyl on it. Or like the guy yeah. you got it from, like, uh, like real life dealers, I can't, like, I can't stand them. I used to be one, but like, I can't stand them because it's like, you know, even if it's some, let's say it's something simple like cannabis, right? I go, I buy cannabis off someone, and he's like, you know, I remember like back in the day, you'd be like, oh, like what kind of, you know, what kind of, what kind of weed is this? Oh, it's dro. Okay, dumbass. Listen, dro is short for hydroponics. That's the method of growing, not the strain. It is, you idiot. You know what I mean? I mean, it's like saying, it's like saying, uh. Hey, uh, what kind of operating system are you using? It uses electricity. <laughs> what? <laughs> what did you just say to me? <laughs> There's no way you're this stupid. You know, I mean, it's like it's like listening to Dual Core here to help at the end of the song. You know, the guy's complaining about how his mouse doesn't work and it's still in the package. You know, like you're a moron. You know, like yeah. <laughs> And but this is the guy you're buying it off of, and that. But that's my point. Like he has no clue what kind it is, where it was. Does it have pesticides sprayed on it? Does it have fentanyl sprayed on it? He doesn't know. You know, he doesn't really yeah. know much of anything, and that's why he's doing what he's doing. Okay, so what kind of um, what um, what kind of payment were you accepting? Um. So yeah, Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin. Only. Yeah, that was it. Uh, I know a lot of guys, they go Monroe and like, honestly, if I was doing it now, Monroe, like when I was vending, I remember Monroe being $19, right? So like, it, it was not what it is today. Um, <laughs> but you did have like uh, Libertas, which was a dark net market that was exclusively uh, accepting Monroe um, as payment. I wouldn't accept Bitcoin or anything else. Um, which my understanding is they moved to I2P and then got busted, um, which I actually just learned the other day, um, making a documentary about the uh, dark net and like going through the history of it all is just crazy. But um, uh, yeah, I forgot, I forgot where I was going. Okay, so washing money is what I want to know. How, what oh, did okay. you do to uh, cash out? Super easy. Yeah, that's, that's probably one of the easiest things to do. So there's a ton of guys who like, um, you know, the, convoluted ways to do it but um i think the simplest way to cash out is with drugs um and be like what the hell like what <laughs> so, <laughs> so um i you know it's it's super easy like you know at the end here's here's the thing right so in vermont uh where like around where i live like a, a really good great good 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 ounce of weed might run you like you know, 225, 250. Okay. Um, so on the dark net, like I can go and um like one of my favorite vendors, he retired, uh, and he's awesome. He's awesome. Um he would list uh like I remember the best deal I ever got from this guy, he was selling popcorn. Buds of Blue Dream, 
Um, and he would only see, he would sell quantity. So you're going to have to buy three to 10 pounds at a minimum from this guy at a time, but that's great. You know? Um, so, but like the best deal I ever got, I forget how much I bought, but I remember I did the math on it and it ended up being 30 bucks an ounce and it's seedless, you know, very few sticks, but the buds were just, they were small. They were like your thumb, but like 30 bucks an ounce. So like, like my cash out would be like, buy a bunch of his weed and anyone that I knew in my area that I knew was like a social butterfly, you know, and I knew would keep their mouth shut. I would turn around and I would say, Hey man, listen, you know, I will sell you, you know, a pound of this weed for 1600 bucks and I'll give it to you up front. Now that's a hundred bucks an ounce. Again, the typical price in that area was two twenty five, two fifty. This guy can turn around, sell ounces for one fifty, undercut everyone by almost a hundred bucks, and make a good amount of money. And he didn't have to put up any money. And he would be able to do that and come back with that in like a week to two weeks. So yeah. I'm getting cash. From all different sources, you know, um, that has no, that I know of has no traceable route to, you know what I mean, because it goes yeah. through the proxy, which is this local dealer who, you know, if this guy does get busted, he's not going to rat me out. The guy selling him a pound for 1600 bucks or a hundred bucks an ounce. He's not going to rat me out. He's going to rat out the guy selling him an ounce for 175. <laughs> why would he burn his best connect if he's gonna snitch he's gonna snitch on the guy who's screwing him over he's gonna snitch on that guy who used to sell him grams for 20 bucks you know so i'm gonna buy his loyalty but i'm also tripling my money yes so I okay make, so that's one way of cashing out that yeah, one makes sense i yep. like it so alternatively aside from that um like one of the one of the things that i like to do was you know, there's a ton of sites that accept Bitcoin um, and you can use Bitcoin to buy just about anything. Um, and I did. But like the precursor to any Bitcoin trans, uh, any Bitcoin transaction or spending that dirty crypto anywhere <clears throat> is for me, I've never used a Bitcoin tumbling service. I think they're retarded. Um, first off, I'm not paying anyone a percentage who's going to take double digit percentages to clean my money. And I have no verification that that's what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'd much rather do is take my Bitcoin and like back in the day, um, I don't know if they still do it. I haven't messed with crypto, uh, you know, since I went to prison, but um, like, what I would do is I would hop on. So you got like shapeshift.io, right? Shapeshift.io is a site that used to let you, I don't know, again, I don't know if it still exists. You used to be able to exchange cryptocurrencies, you know, with no account information. So like I can take Bitcoin, send it to them in exchange. They send me whatever cryptocurrency I tell them to send me, which for me was Monero. Um, so I would exchange like that. And like the, the rate is ridiculously low. Like, I remember exchanging like ten grand, I think, one time, and it was like, it's like five bucks. You know, <laughs> it's like like a money launderer, like in real life, <laughs> is probably going to charge you like ten to like twenty five percent. You know, or way more, um, de depending on who they are and you know who you are. But um. So I love that because I could do it almost instantly. I could do it with no account information. But so here's the thing. So I mentioned Shapeshift IO. Again, going back to OPSEC and security, you know, you don't just Google a site, find it and use it. That works great if you're not doing anything illegal. But like if you're doing illegal stuff, you need to look them up. So like I looked up Shapeshift.io and like I found out that, you know, they basically Anytime the feds ask for anything, they bent over, you know, um, and they had no qualms. It's like, they're like BFFs with the feds, okay. like, you know, just like, you know, Sprint and AT&T, you know, 
They're all, you know, they're all in love together. So um, I was like, yeah, screw them. So the other site that I looked at was Changely. And I had found like some stuff on them, but like um, it was significantly less. So even though like um, I'm accessing the site through Tor, um, so it doesn't really matter if they are talking to the feds, but I just, I was, you know, I was security conscious. So like as many gaps as I could create between me and what I was doing was exactly what I would do. And that's kind of like the definition of OPSEC. Um, <clears throat> but I would switch my currency from Bitcoin to Mono back to Bitcoin. Um, and then I would spend it pretty much wherever. I know um, towards the end, I ended up, uh, like I found this one vendor on the dark net called Gold. Um, G-O-L-D. And um, what he would do is he would charge you 5 to 10% and you would send him your Bitcoin and he would send you cash in the mail. Um, and I love that system. Um, and at the end of the day, <clears throat> that's the reason the feds try to cite for me being busted. Is they'd be like, oh, like we busted these 33 Darknet vendors through Operation Dark Gold. Um, and like, if you if you actually look at the if you look at the history of it if you go into Pacer and you look at like you know when a fr like they proposed a Frank's hearing and all this other stuff you'll see that that wasn't the case um, and and here's the big thing so at the end of the day back then KYC or know your customer policies existed but they were only applicable I don't know if they still are but they were only applicable to banking institutions um, so like. There were some sites that implemented it, but they weren't heavy on enforcing. It. So, like um, local bitcoins had it. They would be like, like you could make a local bitcoins account and do like two thousand dollars worth of transactions, and you didn't have to verify at all. You know, so like there were days where I spent the whole day making local bitcoins accounts. You're like, I'm gonna spend uh -huh. this today. I am going to spend all day and I'm going to make 400 local Bitcoin accounts. Yeah. Um, so, and it was really convenient because with like local Bitcoins, I can switch my, I can switch it up. I can use fake information and I'm swapping, you know, my Bitcoins, which I've already cleaned out to an Amazon credit card, out to a direct deposit, out to cash in the mail, out to, meeting someone up and them handing me cash. Um, so like you could do this. I mean, you had a little bit, is it like, I would like to go out and buy Bitcoin and do it consistently and then build up enough rapport with that seller where now I have his cell phone and we do private sales. Yeah. You know, that's where you need to get to. So like, that's kind of, you know, how that, how it all works. But like, um, getting, like going back to it, like, you know, as long as you, so anyway, so they would be like, oh, like, you know, we caught him because he was selling his Bitcoin and, you know, that's how we caught him. But, but it was nonsense because you can sell me Bitcoin legally all day. <laughs> it's not, yeah. It's not illegal, it, you know? Um, he, so, but they would like, but they were like, there's this guy, Gold. And did you work with him? Did you, did you buy Bitcoin from him or sell Bitcoin to him? No, so I sold Bitcoin to him. Yeah. yeah okay. Yep. So he got caught. Right. And then he worked with the feds catching other people that were on the dark net. Um, cause people would send him Bitcoin. And obviously, like, who's going to send Bitcoin to a guy advertising in the dark net? Probably dark net vendors, right? Or people who want to, you know, uh -huh. cash out Bitcoin anonymously, right? Um, so, like, they were like, oh, well, because this guy was buying Bitcoin on the dark net, and because they, they're, they're, the United States Attorney's big thing was, you paid 10% to cash out your Bitcoin. And that shows criminal intent. And I was like, the one thing I said to my defense lawyer, I'm like, dude, you know there are Bitcoin ATMs that, charge 10%, right? Like, like it's not, un, un, like, 
that makes no sense. You know, it's what? Like, it's like, yeah, I'm going to sell you, uh, uh, you know, a $250 microphone for, you know, $200. And that guarantees that it's stolen. <laughs> That's idiotic. That is, and like, but like to apply that and say like, you know, like, a, like to put that in, in, in like a viewpoint of like the law where it's like, you know, where you're trying to hold someone to guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Like you have no stance because there's so much doubt built into that. Right. So, 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 so you, you was told to this guy huh? and then what was the first, um, like contact from the police? Did you ever get a love letter before that? No, no, I never got a love okay. letter ever. All right. So what was the first contact from the police? Um, so I went one day and so I used to, all right. So at my house, obviously I'm very careful. Like I never invite, no one ever comes to my house. You know, um, no one comes to my house. So like, um, the only people that ever came to my house were people who knocked on the door and like try to sell paintings. Cause again, like where I'm living, it's an affluent area. Right. So like, people would knock on the door, try to sell paintings. Oh, they'd knock on the, like Jehovah's Witnesses would come and knock on the door. Uh -huh. right? Um, so I got a knock on the door. So like, I would say like, uh, seven 15 in the morning. So like, I just got my coffee. So I'm like, I'm sipping my coffee. I walk to the door. I open the door expecting it to be Jehovah's Witnesses. Only people in the last three years who have came to my door. So I open the door, expecting to be Jehovah's Witnesses. And like, I open the door and there's, this dude standing there and he's got a bulletproof vest. He's got a badge that's sewn into the bulletproof vest that I've never seen this badge before. Um, and he's holding up a piece of paper and I won't say his name, but he's like, hi, my name's so-and-so. Um, I'm a special agent with the department of Homeland security. And this is a federal search warrant. And like, I'm sitting there and I'm holding my coffee and I'm looking back at the sky and I'm looking at the 30 people that are behind this guy that have MP5s and ski masks with skulls on them on. And like, um, like this is before COVID. So seeing someone with a mask is, is weird. You know what I mean? Um, okay. So like, I, I see all these people behind this guy and they're all looking through the windows and all this other nonsense. And, um, you know, he's like, Oh, I'm with the department of Homeland security. I have a federal search warrant. And I was like, Oh, Okay, I was like, I guess you want to come in then, huh? And he was like, Yeah. I was like, All right. So as he starts walking in, I'm like, Listen, there's, you know, there's two adult females. You know, one's my cousin, and one's my ex, and then there are three children in the house. Because like, I don't want them, you know, they like to play like they're in Iraq. You know, I don't want them uh -huh. running through you know, pointing an MP5 at, you know, my sons or my daughter, you know, and like, you know, you know, scaring the, the shit out of them. Like, I want them to know who's in there so they're not scared, you know, because if they're not scared, they might be a little bit more relaxed when going through. And they were, and they were, they were, they were there, there's a pretty courteous and calm. And that was, uh, that was my first interaction with them. Just as a step back here, um, Kids in the house with a whole drug lab. <laughs> yeah, there's no, there's, kind of, there's, there's no lab. Um, and it was like the the room that I had, like the cannabis in, was separate from the main house. So that wasn't something that they were around. And the packaging and all that, they never right. And that was that. in a, that was in a clean room, right? Yeah. So they don't see any of that. And all the narcotics that I have were kept in a safe in there. Okay. Um. All right, so so they come through, they see all this stuff? Yeah, so what they do is they they raid, they go through, they find this. The, so, all right, so moving back a little bit, one thing like my that my cousin had been worried about was she was like, all right, let's say we do this and like we get caught. I was like, listen, if we get caught, it's because I screwed up. I'm in charge of everything. You know, I'm in charge of the security. I'm in charge of everything that goes on. So... If something doesn't go right, then it's my fault. So I was like, listen, if so, if they come and they raid us, like I'll tell them it was all me. Because at the end of the day, why am I not? You know, 
Um, if I don't, then they're going to put it on everyone. So like when they came in, you know, they searched and they, they're going through and like they come in, they see me like, oh, any, any drugs in the house? I was like, yeah, they're upstairs. They're in my safe. You know, they're all mine. I'm a dark net vendor. And they were like, what? <laughs> and they were, they were blown away. But like, again, I had an agreement with my cousin prior to this, that if this happened, this worst case scenario, we had a ton of contingency plans. That's part of uh. having good operational security and having good information security policies. It's like, you know, do you have an incident response policy at your work? So didn't we, you know? And this was agreed to prior to anything. So like, that was the thing. Like if we get raided, I admit everything was mine. And I did. I said, listen, I'm a dark no vendor. Everything's mine. And they're like, what's this a combination of the safe? I gave them the combo. What do I do? You say no, they're going to open it anyways. So like, you know, so they opened it up, find a bunch of hash, which they've like, oh, there's a bunch of heroin in here. I think it's hash. They're like, oh, it looks like tar heroin. All right. So like, they field tested it. It comes back as THC. Um, but like, um, so that was, that was my first interaction, but like I admitted, you know, um, like what I, what I had, who I was, um, and what I had done, um, that I was a dark net vendor, um, and that like, you know, I had sold drugs, um, but I, that was it. That's where it ended. Um, and they left. Cause like they, they knew about my cousin cause they had seen her go to the post office, but they didn't know, they knew I existed, but they thought I worked with computers. They weren't expecting what they found, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like they, uh, they were expecting probably, you know, probably to, to find her with drugs. And, uh, that was it. Um, now well, did they take your, take your cousin or take you? No, no, they didn't take either of us cause they didn't have arrest warrants at the time. They just had a search warrant. Um, uh, so they took everything, they lab tested it, documented everything. Um, and then they took off. Um, they're like, you know, we'll be in touch. <laughs> um, and you know, they were, they came back a short while later and they were like, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, they made this, they said, uh, listen, like <clears throat> in the time that you were a vendor. So I think it was like in total, it was like a year and a half, two years. They're like, in the short time that you were a vendor, you have crawled into more crevices and learned more about this culture and seeped into this culture than we've been able to do in six years. Um, because, like, in my short period of time, I inserted myself into the community and, you know, ended up working with these markets and, you know, starting up Dread. And, like, I had become, I had made myself an indispensable part of the community by contributing, you know, and contributing yeah. in meaningful ways. Um, and that's what, you know, made me valuable to the community at the end of the day. And, um, you know, they said, Hey, listen, like, you know, someone with your knowledge, like we could absolutely use that. And, you know, going forward we'd like to bring you a laptop and, you know, you can, you can continue taking orders and, and, you know, vending, you're not actually going to be sending drugs, but you're just gathering information. And, and I was like, man, I'm, I'm what? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, I remember I had been to county before, right? I had been to state prison before. Like, uh, nah, I'm, I'm set, man. I'm like, yo, are you kidding me? Like, I work with cartels, dude. You know what I mean? I work with multiple cartels. You think, uh, like, like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell on people. Like, I'm good. I have a family, man. You know what I mean? Like, like I did this for my family. Now you think I'm going to risk their lives to get out of whatever punishment's coming? You're, yeah, you're delusional. I'd die for them. I'd kill for them. They're my family. You know what I mean? So, like, you know, they they obviously didn't like that. And um, what ended up happening was, um, I had I had borrowed some money from a family member. Because now at this point, like that house that I planned on getting, obviously I'm not getting it. Feds took everything, right? Um, that bubbles burst. So, like, um, you know, I had moved to an apartment, uh, you know, in a in a in a different city, which, 
you know, going from like the mansion that I was at to like this, this shitty ass apartment was horrible. But um, one thing that I had I had had that I had never had uh, in doing that was my wife, um, who I had met on the phone uh, through my actually through my cousin, and we had spent two years talking, um, and like she didn't know obviously she didn't know anything about what I was doing because it would be a, you know, I just consider it to be a massive opsec risk right to tell her um so like i just told her that like i had a business and i wasn't specific about it and um like we learned a lot about each other as i was like doing my vending and she was um, you know she completely unaware of it and um like after i got raided i lost all my electronics so i like lost her number i lost all her info um so i had to go like you know find it all and uh my cousin was able to do it through her facebook and like i remember contacting her and being like, you know, um, she was like, oh, like you haven't talked to me in like four days. Like, is there an issue? And I was like, no, I got raided by the feds, you know? And it's like, it's like, you know, those, those Jews that like, like break up with a woman and tell her that like, oh, I'm a spy. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and she's like, I was like, I got raided by Department of Homeland Security. They came in 30 deep uh, in cooperation with, um. You know, the, the state police, uh, to you know, back up state, their backup was the state police, uh, and like the cyber crimes task force came in and, and she's like, yeah, all right, whatever, Sam, like, listen, if you don't want to talk to me, like you just tell me, <laughs> I was like, I swear to God, I got raided by the department of Homeland Security. <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, she ended up learning that it was true, uh, that my phone did get taken, um. And then she ended up moving from where she was living um, up to up here uh, with like with me. Because I told her, I was like, listen, like I have this indictment. I was like, just forget about me. I'm probably going to do 20 years. You know, like like because we wanted to get married. We had learned we had fell in love by talking to each other and we fell in love intellectually. I didn't know what she looked like and I didn't think she knew what I looked like. We had spent two years talking to her. I had hated I wouldn't take a selfie because of my OPSEC. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so so um like after i got raided like i ended up talking to her i sent her a selfie is now like who's gonna raid me now you know um and she's like oh like i know you know i knew you look like that because like your cousin had showed me a picture of you like a while ago oh. i was like are you kidding me so I was like, <laughs> oh that sucks <laughs> it's she sent me a picture of of herself and like um and she was like way out of my league you know she was like like, dude, I'm like a three, you know, she was, she was an easy 10, you know, I was like, what, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> she was like, <laughs> she was like, it's, you know, who cares? You know, it's like, you know, she, she was like, you're handsome. And I was like, all right, it, whatever. Like, I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> like, I, don't think so. I got imposter syndrome. So like, <laughs> uh -huh. I'm like, no way. But, um, but she, you know, I was like, listen, I'm going to get 20 years. And she was like, um. I was like, you know, just forget about me. You know, we'd be friends and stuff. And she was like, she was like, listen, it's not all about you. I was like, what? And she was like, I, I love you. Like, I'm not, I don't, I don't care how long you get, you know? Um, and that was, that was pretty incredible for me. Um, but like, it was, I had, I had had people in the past who had been in my life who had said they would stick with me through a, a prison term and they didn't. And, uh, so like I was very leery of it, and that's why I kind mm -hmm. of like just didn't want her to have to deal with that. I knew how much pain and agony it was going to be going forward, and um, she did. Man, it was crazy. She stuck with me, um, through my everything, through my sentencing, through my actual prison incarceration. Like so, when I was in prison, I ended up putting in a motion for compassionate release after I I spent eighteen months studying law. But like, I would have never done that. Like, the only reason I did it was because she encouraged me to do it. She was like, you can't quit fighting. You can't quit fighting. And it's kind of like that, you know, that hacker mentality of like, you're going to fail 99% of the time. You know what I mean? Like, and, and you, but you just keep trying because it's, it's about that 1% that you make it. And like, she encouraged you. She was like, you know, don't give up, keep going. And I kept going and, um, I filed and, you know, I, I, I won my freedom. Um, but like she was yeah. a massive part of, of all of the good things that came out of it. Um, so she was your girlfriend going in and then you later married her. Yeah. So, um, so we, we had been talking 
for like two years. Uh, like the, the whole time I had been vending, we had been talking. She had no idea about it. But like I learned her life story by talking to her. We had had conversations where we're talking for 12 hours a day, man. You know, so like I'm trying to like trim cannabis plants and fill up, you know, 20 gallon water buckets and, you know, print out labels. And <laughs> I'm managing to still talk to her for 12 hours, you know, um, and that's addition to, you know, I had three children. So at that same time, I'm also like, you know, making them breakfast, lunch, dinner, they're homeschooled. So I'm making sure they're doing their homeschooling while I'm managing this empire. and. You know, learning about this amazing person who, you know, is one of the first people to ever have faith in me that I've ever, you know, that I've met in my life. Um, and it was just, it was a, it was a really interesting experience. But like, yeah, so like after I got raided, like I had told her, you know, and, and, you know, my, my indictment, all that. And then like, like things with my ex got really bad. So I ended up moving out and me and her moved in together. And that's, like really when we solidified that, you know, we had, we had, we had been engaged on the phone before I even met her, like me going to mass, like, so she lived in Rhode Island. So me going to mass was risky because I still had warrants. there. Uh -huh. So if I got pulled over in mass, man, I'm not leaving. Like I'm here. Yeah. You know? Don't, okay. So, so yeah, you ended up marrying her, right? Yeah. Yeah. She was crazy enough to actually say, yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 And she stood, she stuck by me through my, my whole sentence. Um, and you know, to this day, she's my, my biggest advocate, you know, my biggest fan. Okay. Uh, whenever, I, whenever I like, cause I get into these crazy projects and she'll be that one that's, you know, they're encouraging me and, and you know, help me through it. Cool. Wow. So I'm going to try to wrap this up in the next 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Um, so, uh, how did they know about your cousin? Oh, so, um, so my point with the, uh, with the whole previous part of the story was, um, we didn't know, um, so like the feds were like, oh, like, uh, you know, we caught him cause he cashed out Bitcoin, which makes no sense. Cause again, it's a legal transaction. Um, so what actually happened was my cousin got complacent. What a shock, you know, as, as security people, you know, like some were very used to. Um, you know, give me your password for a chocolate bar. Sure. You know, um, so, um, like what she was doing is she would go to the post office with, you know, 12 packages. I remember I, what I said, three packages would have one return address on them. The next three would have a different return address from a different town. So she's going there with. Okay, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so she's going to the post office with like our agreed upon number was three packages, and now those three packages have the same return address. Now she's going to the post office with 12, 15, 20 packages. And remember, every three packages has a different return address. So she's going there in some cases with, you know, six different return addresses. So like, they're like, what the hell is this? But again, that is not enough for a warrant. It's suspicious and it's reasonable suspicion, but it is not probable cause. Okay. So uh, what ended up happening was the United States Postal Inspector just cut open a package with no warrant, cut open the, the um, package, he cut open the visual barrier, cut open the three layers of uh, vacuum seal and he found some Coke. And then they used that Coke to apply for a federal search warrant for the house after they followed my cousin back to the house. Uh -huh. So, like, for the longest time, I was angry at my cousin because I was like, you know, you didn't follow the security policy and now you're potentially costing me 
200 years in prison because you were too lazy to drive. Even though you built for it, you were too lazy to do your job and drive to these different post houses. And then, like, I came to the realization that at the end of the day, it's not her fault. It's my fault. I was in charge, right? That it was on me to supervise her. And I didn't do a good enough job doing that. And that's why we got raided. So even my OPSEC at the end of the day and my information security policies were so on point that I would have never had an issue with law enforcement. Ever. Um, which screwed well, so, it up. So to, um, so to kind of prove that, um, Hansa went down. Your stuff is all over that database. That was yep. taken over by the Fed. Yep. They did a massive um, arrest through yep. that. Yep. Um, hundreds of people in the U.S. And so it was European, but they did Operation a lot Operation Bayonet, yeah. Mm -hmm. They did hundreds of arrests in the U.S. for dealers, mostly vendors. Yep. You weren't one of them. So nope. that kind of proves that you were, uh, OPSEC was tight. Right. Right. And um, like uh, I had, I had, so I had gotten, um, in my discovery, I had gotten times when I looked through my discovery and the feds actually bought drugs off me like 20 times. They mm -hmm. bought Coke. They bought LSD. They bought cannabis. Um, I think the only thing they didn't buy was moonshine, but they bought pretty much everything. Um, and like there was nothing from it. There's no fingerprints. There's no hair. Not even microscopic DNA. Like there's nothing. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, again, it was like that smallest little thing you know, is what caused it. And that was her complacency. And my being overwhelmed, doing all these jobs, you know, having my attention so divided that I did not do a proper job in monitoring her and making sure that she was doing her job correctly. So the real kicker of this is that... um. We get raided. I tell them, you know, it's all mine, blah, blah, blah. So I go for my arraignment, right? So now I move out of the house I was in to an, a different apartment. So this the Department of Homeland Security showed up on the day of my arraignment to that old house because they didn't know I moved. They wanted to arrest me there and bring me into court in handcuffs, but I didn't live there anymore. And the geniuses didn't know I didn't live there anymore. And... So, you know, the rock stars, they are, you know, they had no clue where I was. So my ex had told them, oh, he moved in, you know, with his fiance and this is the address. And by the time they got to this address, I was already halfway to the federal courthouse to go turn myself into the U.S. Marshals for my arraignment. Uh -huh. So I go... I get out of the car at the United States District Court in Burlington, Vermont. I see my lawyer, uh, who is amazing, Stephanie Greenleaves, phenomenal federal lawyer. Um, and, well, all right, all right, all right. So going back a little bit. So what ended up happening was I had admitted to everything and I was the only one charged. So... What ended up happening was my lawyer had applied for what's called the Franks hearing. A Franks hearing is when you can show law enforcement broke the law in order to catch you. This was my security policy from the start. It was like, if you guys are going to catch me, I'm going to make this maze so complicated that you're going to have to jump over a wall in order to do it. And then, of course, like it's that whole thing you see like on Law and Order where it's like, oh, fruit of the poisonous tree. You know, they broke the law in order to do this. So everything's invalidated. And that was another part of my plan. That's why I had, I was ready to admit to it so readily. I knew my rights. I knew I wasn't under any obligation to talk. I knew that I was better off asking for a lawyer. But I also knew that they would most likely have to break the law in order to bust me. And that if that's the case and I admit to everything and they get everything, everything's got. There's nothing else they can do. If every If everything from that arrest... From that original search warrant is thrown out, there's no case. Now, keep uh -huh. in mind, the feds have a conviction rate of 99%. They don't lose. It's like you playing chess with me, and I tell you, all my pawns are queens. Uh, I'm not going to yeah. lose. 
you know? So that's what it's like playing them. So now I got this Frank's hearing scheduled. Now that said, with this Frank's hearing scheduled, a Frank's hearing is very difficult to get. It's super, super hard to get. Um, I couldn't find one case where someone got it when I was in feds looking at the law library. Um, so it's extremely difficult to get. So the United States attorney Drescher contacts my lawyer and tells her, I don't want to go to this Frank's here. So like my lawyer contacts me. She's like, Oh, he said he doesn't want to go to this Frank's hearing. And I was like, yeah, I bet he doesn't want to go to this, <laughs> this Frank's hearing. You know, like we're going to prove like everything that they did. First of all, everything you got was, it was done so illegally. Um, so I guess he, he told her, he was like, listen, tell him that if he pleads guilty, I'll give him a maximum of 108 months, which is like nine years. Um, I'll give him a maximum of 108 months. So if he doesn't, and we go to this Frank's hearing, he'll get nine of the 10 of his charges dropped, but he won't get his conspiracy charge dropped. And I was like, well, what's he mean? And she was like, oh, did you read your PSR? So PSR is a pre-sentence report. It's basically the background of your whole life. Um, so I was like, no. So I went and I looked at it. It was like page 15. And like on that page, um, it said Geneva's proffer. So when I had first gotten arraigned, after I got out, I got released on my own recognizance. After I got out, my lawyer had called me up and she was like, oh, do you want to come in and do a proffer? I was like, what's a proffer? And she was like, well, a proffer is like when you come in and you tell them what you did, who you worked for, who like who bought off you, who did what, what vendors that you worked with and what you know about them. I was like, yo, man, that sounds kind of like snitching to me. And she was like, well, we don't call it that. And I was like, well, the people I work with would. <laughs> yeah. like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. That's a death sentence for not just me, but my family. But aside from that, like, I'm just not on that kind of time. Like, I'm good. You know, I'm not going to I'm not going to put people in a box because I'm scared about being in a box. You know, like what I, I'm a man. I was so what I did, I'll accept responsibility for. Um, so he's like, all right. So like when when they were like, oh, did you read your PSR or read page 15 or whatever? And I went back and I see Geneva's proffer. Immediately, I know what a proffer is now. <laughs> yeah. And I go through it and it says like, she confesses to all this stuff. Like, you know, oh, like he had me send these packages out. I didn't know what was in the packages. And like, I'm like, you got a percentage of every, you know, everything that was in the package, you got a percentage of. You know, and like, you know, like you helped me with the labels. Like, you know, what? So it was just completely mind blowing. But um, yeah, so, so I had, so I'd went into court, uh, you know, with this plea deal uh, signed. Cause like, so he was like, you know, your cousin proffered on you. So at the end of the day, if you go to this Frank's hearing, you'll get your nine charges dismissed. And like, it was like possession with intent for a bunch of drugs. Then the three last charges were money laundering. But the first charge was conspiracy. And the reason I had that conspiracy charge was because my cousin had already proffered on me. And they also charged her with conspiracy. And I told her, if you don't say anything and I don't say anything, they can't prove there's a conspiracy. You have to have uh -huh. an admission. Uh <laughs> or you have to be able to prove that we conspired. And as long as you don't say anything, they won't be able to prove that. Um, and that was, but unbeknownst to me, she'd already said something. Um, and she lived with me while I was on pretrial for like a year. And the whole time she was giving, you know, she was talking to the feds, giving them evidence. Um, so it was absolutely crazy, man. Uh, but like, you know, the, the one takeaway that I got was like, you know, what I did, I did, and I did, you know, out of desperation. I had I had done it for my family, but it was definitely the wrong thing to do. I did it so that I could have a good place to be with my family. And like the irony of me becoming a drug trafficker, an international drug trafficker, um, because I didn't want my kids to have to live next to a house full of crack addicts. You know, that irony is not lost on me. The fact that like I was taken away from all of them, you know, I lost I lost my family. I lost Everything that I had worked for, I had lost with the exception of that one constant, which was my wife who, you know, remained in my life and, and you know, helped help 
get me through a lot of those those rough patches, you know. Um, and I think at the end of the day, that's really the the big difference between family and relatives. Those people who aren't just blood related to you, but the ones who uh, you know s- stick it out with you through the worst worst of times, you know. Yeah. So, um, any idea how much you made through all this? Um, no, nah, I've I have no idea. Like you said, I think the first week it was three hundred. Second week it was five hundred. There's a bunch of dry spells in between, but I think um, like the last last week it was probably like the last month maybe it was about twenty grand probably every two to three days. Well, um, I was going to say it was probably less than the two hundred thousand that you were saving for. Right. I mean, so if you were to add up like all the equipment and the like the drugs and like like stuff like that, um, yeah, I would. I mean, I made, I made a good amount, but like, yeah, it was. I wouldn't bet much about it. I'm like my sentencing judge. Basically, when I went in front of him, he's like, "I've never seen a crime like this before." Um, and like after he sentenced me, he was like, "When you get out, Mister Ben," he was like, "You know, I hope when you're on the street, like you come up to me and you like, you know, introduce me to your family and like he's like you're highly intelligent. I look forward to." you know, seeing you put your mind towards, you know, doing productive and, and good things. And that's kind of, um, I mean, I've, I've, that's pretty much like what I've, my goal has been this entire time with getting out, kind of letting people know about federal prison, letting like my big, the, the, my motivation for giving my DEF CON talk, um, con, you know, the United States attorney said that, He's like, oh, you're teaching people how to sell drugs. And it's and it's an idiotic thing to say. Um, because it's like, I see a guy on YouTube picking locks. And it's like, that guy's teaching burglars how to break into houses. Listen, that burglar knows how to break into your house already. Okay? He's not going to YouTube to learn how to do it. You know? Um, it's like, you know, that, that guy who's breaking into security systems, he's not going to DEF CON to learn how to do it. You know? He most likely... He already has a pretty good idea of what a vulnerability is and how to leverage it with an expert. You know? <laughs> um, so that's moronic. But like my point with it was like, listen, a lot of the people who are at DEF CON, they're highly intelligent people, but like we can be highly intelligent, but when we're put in a situation where our back is against the wall, a lot of times, you know, we make an irrational choice. And that was my case. It was an irrational choice. And my whole point with it, it's a very easy transition to go from hacker to darknet vendor because you already know about encryption. You already know about, you know, infosec. You already know about a lot of these things. So it's it's not a difficult transition to do. And my whole goal was really to show people like, I hope you don't, you know, because it's not beneficial. And like you had pointed out, like the money that you make is pathetic in comparison. You know, like go learn how to break into systems, go to DEF CON, do the black bag, uh, black bag challenge and, you know, get a company that's you know trying to recruit you for $150,000 a year. <laughs> You'll be much better off. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> or make yeah, a podcast, it's... you know? <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, we're running low on time here. So I, I, I'm going to cap it with um, some of the stuff you said in your talk, you know, such as studying law in prison and getting out early and 60 mm-hmm. month sentence. But um, I want to leave you with a, a last thought here, maybe. And um, maybe it's, uh, you can take it however you want to go, but I give you a thought bubble to get started with, um, which, is, you know, is there such thing as perfect OPSEC? And does it matter when you're, breaking the law um so i think i think at the end of the day there's definitely so i mean that's basically like saying can one army be better than the other and the obvious answer to that is yes i don't think there's such thing as 100 percent secure i think anyone who kind of tries to sell those wolf tickets is you know ignorant to security <laughs> um but i definitely think that one army can overcome another 
Right. And that's that's, that's that's essentially what it is. It's two opposing forces. You know, um, how good are your moves in comparison to your enemies? You're playing chess. One of you is going to win. You know, like it's not always going to be a stalemate. And yeah. like as evidence of that, I would say, you know, at the end of the day, um, I met a ton of drug traffickers in federal prison. Not surprising considering the fact that like some like 70% of people that are in federal prison are there for drugs um, or drug trafficking. Um, I didn't meet one dark net. Uh, I bet that's changed. Well, you, you weren't you weren't there that long. I say, yeah, I, I went into, I, I self-surrendered uh, October 1st of 2019. And I had 60 months. There's no parole in feds. You know what I mean? So I should be there until one... 2024 is my release date but because i studied law and i learned you know that that powerful you know the the lawyer's programming language <laughs> i <laughs> learned it <laughs> you know um and i wrote a buffer overflow i wrote a georgia page motion and i sent it in and you know the last the, the last part of that buffer overflow was let me out and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice job there. That was the way to do it. I'm super impressed with that part. Okay, I'm going to leave it here. I think we covered enough for me. Excellent. How does it feel for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think I, I mean, I, it's been, a, if you've watched any of my YouTube videos, um, it's been a while since I talked this fast. And that was mainly to, Try to cram in as much information yeah. as possible, but um, three hours. <laughs> I mean, dude, honestly, we could go on. It's like a Joe Rogan, you know. I, I mean, yeah, we we could go on for another four hours expanding yeah, on these things. I mean, it's absolutely insane. So, like, if uh, you know, if you ever run out of guests or like, you know, the the one you have disappears or whatever, man, you wanna you wanna jump back into it? Let me know because <laughs> uh, I will be. I'm working on it by myself, so. Yeah, it's fucking insane. But like, um, but I you're the kind of guy to do that. You're the one to <laughs> figure things out and to like say, all right, this. I mean, other people can figure it out. I can figure it out. Yeah. So, well, I'm. I'm I have a 600 page book that I'm about to publish, um, and it has all the law, all the case sites, and how to structure a compassionate release motion, so I can empower all those guys that are still stuck in federal prison to get themselves out, like I did. Um, uh -huh. and like what the, some of the dirty shit the Bureau of Prisons does is they block you from being able to go to the law library and they blame it on COVID. So like me making this book and putting it out there will empower them to fight that system and get out. Then my next move as I'm doing that, and I'm at 600 pages right now I, and I'm editing it right now. It's, and so I'm about to publish it probably, I'm going to publish it in like two to three months at the longest, but uh -huh. at the same time. I'm doing a massive documentary. I've never made a documentary before. Um, so I'm teaching myself After Effects and Premiere Pro as yeah. I do my YouTube videos and audition um, and writing my book and working 60 hours a week. Um, I'm closing on a house tomorrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, you're a high powered guy. Um, so like, and I'm still trying to run my blog, make my blog posts. Um, and then after this book gets published, I'll be, I'm still working on that documentary, but then I have to start my second book, which is everything that you just, I just told you about is basically going to be in that just more verbose. Yeah. Well, cool. I'm going to hit the stop button here.